Welcome to the Soul Connector Show. My name is Kevin Devani. My very, very special guest is Eric Basquiel um, from the States. And he's been traveling all over the world. And uh, uh, could you just introduce yourself, Eric? Thanks so much for taking your time. And um, yeah, please go ahead. I'm Eric from the States and I travel all over the world. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I've done a lot of things, uh, but right now I, I, uh, I primarily work on uh, Bitcoin core development through the LeBitcoin um, open source project. And uh, I write on crypto economics. Uh, that just kind of grew out of necessity, um, trying to understand what we're doing and explain things to people over time. And um, I travel a lot. I, um, into 80 countries, I think, at this point, and uh, always try to get more. I think I'm going to get to Liechtenstein next month, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, um, I, uh, I'm currently rebuilding a motorcycle, so that uh, yeah, so I've seen those I'm, like uh, by, like like a craftsman ship, right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I like to work with the humans too. So. Uh -huh. uh, and I was in the Navy for 10 years. Um, and I was a, a pilot and tactics instructor as well. So I have uh, and you know martial artist for 25 years uh, so I have some background in physical security big companies small companies I was a I was a intern at IBM in 1986 I started programming in 1982 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, uh, Microsoft bought my first company uh, I became a principal architect in their Windows division uh, for about two and a half years um, in uh, in the uh, around 2006 or so um, did a couple other startups, and uh, now I just kind of work on open source and volunteer my time. Okay, um, what's your? How did you find your path to Bitcoin? What, what's what's the passion about Bitcoin? That's a long, uh, twisted road. Um, at some point, when I was in the Navy, I kind of uh, became more politically active. Um, I was probably pretty typical of any any recent college grad up to that point, um, but. Um, Crypto anarchist, you call yourself, right? <laughs> or that, yeah, I don't man, know that's a fair term. It's yeah. cypherpunk, crypto anarchist. Uh, you know, there's a lot of labels, but the labels always carry a lot of baggage, so people don't always always get uh, what I mean. But um, yeah, I, uh, it was I guess early '90s. Um, I uh, through some securitist route, I, I determined that I was a libertarian, and I was a card carrying member of the American Libertarian Party for I don't know 23 years or so, and. And I decided I was an anarchist. Um, the final step in that progression was uh, reading Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy, and the State, which is yeah. a Classic. an excellent um, economics tome, proof. Um, and um, found Bitcoin uh, through, through that, uh, I guess, that path. I became, uh, I was still programming while I was in the Navy, just for fun. And eventually that's what led to my first business. Um, uh, in the early to mid 90s, I became interested in PGP and um, Digicash, which was David Chom's project. Uh, I even sent an email to Digicash because one of their founders or, or first employees um, has my name. Uh, I'm, I'm Dutch and he was based in Amsterdam um, and the guy's name was on one of the patents. So I was very curious. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's possible I ran into the same guy when I was at IBM because they had an internal email system, which I found my name on. Um, and uh, both times I sent him a message, I never got a response. So um, I, uh, I was interested in that for, you know, political reasons. Um, my economic, you know, understanding wasn't very advanced at the time. Um, but, um, uh, and, and technology reasons. But as, as that failed due to its kind of, you know, central centralization flaw, um, um, among other things, uh, I just became, you know, kind of disillusioned. I didn't really pay any attention to electronic, you know, political electronic kind of currency solutions. Um, even as Bitcoin came along, um, and ironically, at the time I was in my third startup and I was, um, I was spending an awful lot of time programming uh, PayPal APIs and uh, Amazon Flexible Payment Services. Um, I even went down to uh, PayPal headquarters uh, under eBay and, and uh, took, a, took a class on there new API at the time. So uh, I was trying to solve some problems that, you know, the Bitcoin uh, sort of solves. Um, and with my background, I would have easily recognized Bitcoin, um, but I hadn't, I just, again, I didn't, I didn't bother looking at these things as they came and went over the years until I uh, shut down my third company. The third one failed. And uh, that same day I, I picked up a copy of Forbes magazine, which had 
Andy Greenberg's uh, expose on the Silk Road. And um, as soon as I read about it, I, I went straight to the Bitcoin white paper and, and read it. And I've been working on Bitcoin ever since. I then found a code base that I wanted to work in. Um, <clears throat> picked the Bitcoin for a number of reasons, including Amir. And uh, within a, I don't know, a couple of weeks, I had found uh, a mutual friend and uh, um, ended up going out to see Amir in Calafu, which is uh, near Barcelona. Uh, and, um, and that went well, so I, I decided to stick with the project and eventually I became kind of more, much more involved than he, he was and um, st still on to this day. So uh, for a while I worked on, I started out working on a, a hardware wallet. Um, I decided that, that the market was not ready. Um, software wasn't ready. Technology wasn't ready for what I wanted to do. So I put it on the shelf after about a year of uh, prototyping a design and um, just continued to work on the Bitcoin. And it was that work that kind of, and my, my background in studying uh, economics, politics, and security, uh, that kind of led me to uh, doing a lot of the crypto, crypto economics uh, writing. Um, so that's how, I, that's how I came to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, let me just show for the sake of um, um, remembrance, it's, I really find this cool. I mean, because I, I, I watched the movie Top Gun in the, 80, in the 80s, 85 to 87, I think the movie was. And, and uh, I just find your, I don't know, your whole curriculum video so, so fascinating. And you've got this, uh, you write these articles, right? On libit on the github.com, the libit coin system. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I tried to read them, all of them, uh, but <laughs> I don't know whether I'm, I'm going to finish them. That'll oh. take a while. There's over 70 now. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So, um, just recently, you know, there was this talk, um, uh, with, uh, on the world crypto network with Max and, you know, Nick Carter. So I jumped into that interview in the middle of it. And I think I had the impression you were like dropping one bomb after another, uh, like because of your, you know, profound knowledge and your pragmatic approach to everything. <sighs> I was like blown away because uh, there were two things that came to my mind instantaneously. I was like, hopefully people who come, you know, who are new to Bitcoin don't listen or don't hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because I mean, our intent or my intention, my vision, my wish is, you know, mass adoption, mass education, mass adoption. And, you know, what you always say is the separation money from state. I, I consider state in a bigger, you know, bigger context and a bigger picture. Um, for me, is the question who controls the state? Does the state control, you know, the central banking structure, including the BIS, or is it vice versa? Or can we just say it's the collusion without going into a conspiracy, is the collusion between state and the, the global central banking structure? So I want to have uh, of course, your take, your thoughts on that, and I'm um, going to stop, you know, my rant about this. The the whole reason why I wanted you to on this interview is because um, 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 there was this discussion on Twitter. I found, you know, this book by Safeda Namus, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, I was I was critiquing some comment. It was, it was weird that, sorry to interrupt you for a second. No, no, go ahead. No. I was, uh, I was just you know, looking through my Twitter feed a couple of years ago and I saw some comments uh, from a guy I didn't know, it turned out to be him, but um, they were just kind of, um, you know, just obvious economic errors and I pointed them out and uh, turned into a, like a long discussion. And uh, at some point he said, hey, you, you know, why don't you review my book? And so he sent me a PDF copy of a draft before it went to, well, before it was published anyway, before it was available. And, uh, you know, I read it and I started sending him some critiques privately and, you um, I don't know. I guess we still had some discussions going on on Twitter, but at that point he blocked me, and uh, we haven't spoken since. So, oh, interesting. Uh, it's a little okay. late to send the book out to review. I know he had other people review it, but um, mm -hmm. you know, Bitcoin's kind of an echo chamber, and so yeah. you say things people want to hear, and they they tend to support you, and that's kind of the impression I get. Um, so, uh, yeah, you'll find I have, um, you know, it, it's not it's not all bad, but there are a number of errors, and uh, to me, those are important, mm -hmm. and. I think they kind of tend to lead people where they want to go. Yeah. I mean, listen, I mean, I have the utmost ex uh, uh, respect for Safedo Namus. 
he's done a really, you know, as from my, you know, with my knowledge, I have a, a you know, legal background. I don't have an economics background. I, I myself, you know, digged into all these books from, from Jesus Huerto de Soto to Rothbard to Hayek. Uh, <laughs> so I, I went the same rabbit hole through like many other people, but, you know, and I don't think I'm, I'm you know, I'm asking stupid questions. And I, no. I really, I, I just asked him a couple of times, a qu uh, you know, a couple of questions, never got an answer back, uh, which I found a little bit disrespectful, but it doesn't matter. I don't take it personally. I'm just, you know, maybe just really too busy or... Yeah. You just, Some people are busy. I've, I've got lots of time. Like I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just not <laughs> sympathetic. I don't know, to some people. So anyway, so it's about, you know, this... Uh, and I thought, you know, I had thought I understood the term stock to flow ratio, especially, you know, when it comes to gold, you know, you divide the stock, divide it by the, by the flow and you get that number, whatever that is in gold, uh, 62 or something. So, uh, uh, and I thought, okay, now, now I get it. You know, what is low stock to flow ratio? What is low, lower, lowest or high, higher, highest stock to flow ratio comparing it to gold, Bitcoin, any other metal. So I've got this, um, I remember it was page 130 and on page 173. And, and then fortunately enough, some other people, uh, also Gigi who wrote all these awesome articles, he, he confirmed and the other guy from plan B uh, or whatever his handler is on Twitter, 100 trillion US dollar, whatever, he correct or he uh, he confirmed my understanding that this is wrong, this, the way it yeah, is yeah, there formulated. Yeah, there was obviously a, an unintended mistake there. I saw that series yeah. of tweets. Yeah, it's a human error. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm myself a publisher. Economic. Yeah, I'm an author. I know what it is like. Yeah. Uh, so uh, good on you for finding a, it was an important error, you know, but, uh, but not intended, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, in the second edition, I guess he's got to correct it. So... Uh, so then, you know, finally, uh, and thankfully, you you came up, and uh, somehow you you must have found my uh, or uh, that that whole discussion, and you answered, you know, uh, very succinctly uh, what it what this whole thing is about, you know, the the connection between stock to flow, inflation, and then you also say, you know, why why uh, I think somewhere in your articles you say why why in why invent. Or, or recreate another term for for inflation, right? Yeah. When it comes to stock flow. So please, would, what, what's your take on this whole issue with the stock to flow and the scarcity uh, thing, the, which which I think is really important in, uh, from my perspective? Okay, um, you know, I could talk for quite a while, but um, go ahead. Succinct. Um, first of all, uh, the term stock to flow is is by no means new. It's by no means an invalid concept. Um, uh, uh, fundamentally, what it is, is one over monetary inflation. <laughs> That's it, right? So monetary uh, inflation is, uh, you know, a measure of rate uh, of increase or, or decrease of monetary units. Um, and so you flip that over, you get, you know, um, you know so some, something, uh, so, some, num some amount of time because rate is units, which is, itself unitless right so units per second units per hour uh, of inflation where where you get um you get hours right or time it's a time measure right mm -hmm. so time per unit so that's all it is um and the the concept uh you know at least from wikipedia i mean you know, i'm not a historian but originates from <clears throat> the idea a very very basic idea right so that the relationship between inflation and stock to flow is tautological they're the same Right. I mean, mathematically, they're, it's, 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 I, I don't know if it would be called an identity, uh, but they're equal to each other. One over one is e one is one over the other. So they're inverse. Um, but stock to flow was this idea that, um, you know, if I've got a certain amount of income uh, in stuff, stock, whatever, uh, and I've got, I mean, sorry, you know, uh, income in goods or services or money. And I've got a certain stock in the in the, in the warehouse. Uh, then um, and I'm and I'm and I'm also losing stock. I'm getting rid of it. Then uh, I can calculate over time how much I will have at a certain time if I know how much stock I have, if I know my income, and if I know my expense. Right. So you can lump income and expense together and just net them out and say my net income. Okay. Yeah. If you know your net income and you know your stock, you will know the future. Um, that but there's a big assumption there that you you know the income, right? And you know so. Um, it, it's useful for predicting the future when you already know the future, right? When you know the future mm -hmm. income, it's not really a prediction mechanism at all. It's just a mathematical relation. 
Um, it's like rate times time equals distance. But it's, um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of what it means. Um, I don't know, what else would you, uh, I could go into a lot of different subjects. Yeah, I think the connection was, uh, in my specific point, uh, was the hardness of money right so hardness? because yeah because we got this centralized central banking fiat uh you know inflationary debt system and so uh, it's a fundamental problem right uh, because of the inf infinite money production right well, let me, uh, i mean I, I don't uh, a lot of times i ask questions to make people think not because yeah. you know any other reason so what so uh i would ask uh free to define the problem you say it's a problem what's the problem it's easier to when we identify the problem to find the you know solutions right so what is the problem of fiat money creation? Uh, well, the, the problem, the, the essence of the fiat money, uh, the, the essence of the problem, I think, or the cause is that uh, it does not have any kind of scarcity. It is infinite. Well, what, 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 you're talking about a cause. I, I'm talking about what's the, what's the damage? What's the problem? It's the devaluing, the devaluation of money. Right and right. and and everything, the whole chain reaction that comes with it, the disruption of supply and demand, the whole economical system, it's Keynesianism. So, but, so, but so, the whole monetary system. What's the problem from your perspective then with the monetary system that we have right now? So, so you said it's a, it's the reduction in value, and, and of course, value is subjective, right? It's not constant. It's in the minds of all people. So, value changes, right, and go up and go down. So, value changing in the money is not itself inherently a problem. Right? It's a necessity. <laughs> um, it's an absolute uh, economic truth. So the question, uh, I'm trying to get very specifically to identification of the problem before I go on to solutions, right? Okay, there's the pro what's the problem? The problem is that things change in value. Of course they do. People's minds change. Um, so um, the problem, uh, so <laughs> to, to define something that's right or wrong or problematic or good or bad or evil, right? We have to have some kind of basis of morality or something, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I would describe that as aggression, right? The, the non-aggression principle is my defining uh, principle when it comes to good, evil, right, wrong. Um, and um, when you talk about a problem, to me, that's the only thing we can be talking about, right? Mm -hmm. the, only, the only wrong is aggression when it, when it comes right down to it. Uh, the, the uninitiated use of force to get what you want or for whatever reason. So um, where does that arise in fiat money? Right? Where's the problem? Well, the problem is that, uh, that when we're talking about state money, right, and the use of state money is compelled through le uh, legal tender laws, it's restricted through foreign exchange controls, um, and uh, it's also controlled through counterfeit laws, right? So people can't lawfully make, literally make money, right? <laughs> um, and uh, the state reserves to its right that privilege. Historically, that privilege of coining the money as opposed to just weighing it, uh, gets reserved by the state, and that's why the, the, the term for it is seniorage, which refers to the, the senior or the, or the authority, um, we, we refer to as the sovereigns, right? So the sovereign reserves it to itself the power to coin money, um, whether that's printing or stamping a number on, this, on the side of a coin. I mean, we had fiat money with metals as well, right? The Romans did a tremendous job with inflating their, their gold um, over the years. So um, this, this privilege uh, is considered valuable because it, uh, the difference between, so typically if you went to a, say just a private company to stamp your gold into some circular shape and put a you know, weight on it, it costs you some money to do that, costs them some money to do that. And the profit they make is, is senior option, right? It's the, it's the profit on minting money. Um, the state, by the state controlling uh, through counterfeit laws uh, the inability for other people to do that, they have a monopoly on the minting of that money. So right? can I just ask you one important question? So the counterfeiting, yeah. uh, so, so if, if, the, if the state or whatever, the, the, yeah, if the state or the national bank, the, the central bank of each You state, can just roll them all up into one. It's all state banking, right? <laughs> exactly. But then they have the monopoly over counterfeiting then, in my view. Well, counterfeiting, counterfeiting is the law. Yeah. Anti-counterfeit laws is the law that creates the monopoly. Exactly. That's exactly what it means, right? So, so you have a law that creates a monopoly. Whenever you have a monopoly and you have demand for something, now demand is created through legal tender laws mm -hmm. right? and other laws like uh, the requirements to pay tax in the, in the money and foreign exchange controls. All the, these laws roll up together in, in, to, to increase demand. So you have a monopoly on supply 
and you have a uh, uh, you have a state compelling people um, in a in a way that inc incites demand. So uh, there, you know, supply and demand are the only thing that de de determine price. And uh, so the the price um, increases uh, to the point where they're making uh, large profits, uh, not because of the cost of making the money. It's because of lack of competition. Right? If there was competition to make the money, it was free competition, there was no counterfeit laws, it wouldn't even matter that people were compelled to use it. Competition would arise to make as much money as people demanded, and then there would be the only profit in Sinirash of this money would be just like a private coin minter, right? It would be um, the cost of, or the, it would effectively be the market rate of return on capital, right? The profit that somebody needs to make to stay in business. And the profit above which, if you go, competition enters to bring it back down. So, so really, it's the it's the it's the inflation. I mean, it's the um, uh, counterfeit con counterfeit laws concept that that makes fiat money fundamentally and economically different than other monies because it it's unlawful to make it. Right. So now you would think, well, geez, if people start making paper, fabric, plastic, whatever, whatever these monies are made of, right? Metal fibers. There's all kinds of stuff in money. We call it paper, but uh, in in fiat. Uh, even coin, right? So, you know, there would be so much of it, it wouldn't be usable. And then you might also think, well, it'd be so easy to fake. How would people know the difference? Well, okay, there's a presumption that when people accept fiat money, they know the difference, right? People validate it. Now, they may not do it very well, but if it's so good, you can't tell the difference. It's just somebody making more of the money, mm -hmm. right? It's more production. So, so you have this concept of validation, you have this concept of production, and you have a, an increase of supply until supply meets demand, and now you have a money, right? Now, something is defining the rules of the money. That's, the, that's society, right? If it's not the state, it's society. So society's decided they take a $100 bill, but not a $1,000 bill, right? There's no such thing. So now you just end up with an awful lot of $100 bills, right? And we've seen this even in Venezuela recently, with just bills, just notes, just covering the streets, right? So the problem with fiat money in a, in a, in a free, free, market, free market system or paper money would be that um, there'd be too much of it, right? It's not portable. And portability is a fundamental, uh, is a property of good money, right? Good money needs to be portable. Now, oil gets used as a money. It's not really tremendously portable, but it's actually really portable if you want to take, you know, move large amounts of it around the oceans, you know. And so some scenarios, mm -hmm. uh, you can move it through pipes, which you can't really do through gold, with gold, right? So in some scenarios, it's, it's very good. So portability is the problem when it comes to the quantity of it. That's it. It becomes a poor money when there's too much of it, when demand uh, causes enough to be created. <clears throat> now, of course, there's a relationship between that and the prevalence of it on the planet. There's a lot of trees, right? Um, but both of those things can change. You know, prevalence and the, uh, and the demand are what determined um, how much gets produced. Can I just ask you one little question? Do you think there's more than enough gold, but it's just we are lacking right now the real technologies, you know, the resources to go deeper and deeper and more dig than an, more gold out of it? More than enough for what? I don't know, to make it really super abundant and make it worthless. To, I mean, Well, like, what will like, make it abundant is demand. Yeah, but demand comes because of the scarcity, right? No, no. See, this is the, this is the error that, that has been fed to people. Okay, go ahead. Demand doesn't come because of scarcity. Demand becomes because of whatever reason people want something for. <laughs> right? it, that's, why, why do you want a hamburger? Because you like burgers. I don't know. It's not because there's not a lot of them. Right? Um, it, it's, uh, so the, there's, there's this idea that so any, any sound economist, um, and when I refer to economics, I'm, I'm strictly referring to praxology, uh, Austrian school, Rothbardian, um, um, concepts, right? And so if we ever want to go off and debate those, that's a whole other, another subject. But, um, you know, usually in Bitcoin, people aren't too far off from that, at least in their own minds, right? Um, but uh, this idea of value is entirely subjective. That's a fundamental principle in, in economic theory. Value is not subject to anything but what's in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, so if people value something higher, they will trade more for it things that other people value higher and that will um, you know, that's, that's demand, right? This, this, I, I want it more than I want something else that I have. So I'll trade something else that I have for it. So demand creates supply supply. Lack of supply doesn't create demand. 
Okay, but gold, be... but gold, but uh, gold, Eric, this is important because I want others to understand, to comprehend this process mm -hmm. of thinking. So, okay, okay, we got gold. It's for decoration, jewelry, industrial purpose, and as a store of map value, me and maybe medium of exchange. With, but that is another chapter. I would argue that value can't be stored because okay. it's in your mind. Mm -hmm. But uh, but that's another discussion. Okay. <laughs> gold can be stored. Yeah. Its value can't. Yeah. It can change. It can drop to zero, just like anything else. Mm -hmm. So you could no longer value it, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you find out it's, you know, or, or toxic or something, right? Something you used to value, and now you don't. So, um, yeah, so these, there's a lot of assumptions that people make, and they jump from one thing to the next without actually thinking things through because they're not intuitive, right? Economics is fundamentally counterintuitive. It's why we end up with communism, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so you have to really, you can't just jump through these concepts and make assumptions like, well, you know, it's, it's valuable because it's scarce. No, it's because it's, it's rare on the earth, gold is portable. That's it. That's not what creates its demand. It's one of its properties. There's others. It's a yellow metal. <laughs> yellow metals are more distinguishable than others, which made, which made it a better metal than others. It's, an, it's elemental, which means it's hard to derive, uh, it, it's hard to produce, right? You can't manufacture it easily, but you can. And it's manufactured in mass quantities in space, right? Um, and practically unlimited quantities. So, um, seriously, it, it, I mean, uh, what do you mean? Like produce gold. with, like with chemical, whatever technological processes do you mean? Or so? these, these would be, these would be nuclear processes. Okay. Or plasmatic yeah. or nuclear. Okay. Got, got yeah. it. Got gotcha, you. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you know, um, interest. <laughs> so, so gold can be manufactured from other elements. It's possible. Right. And it's done on, uh, you know, a, a super large scale, you know, in the, in the universe. So yeah, that, that's um, like a hardcore statement for, I think you're shocking that right now people who are listening, who would be listening. I, I mean, I don't think, I mean, any, you know, come no, on, because, any, you know, from one day to another, you could make gold abundant. I mean, uh, I mean, wor I mean worthless. Make, Why do people hoard make. gold? Because they think it's really scarce, right? I mean, that's in the, what's in the mind uh, in most no, people. No, no, no. They, they, right? they, 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 that's, no. I mean, it's a good money. That's why they value it. Um, not because it's scarce. Uh, it's, it's rarity on the planet makes, you know, gives it a portability property. Um, okay. But that's not the only reason people value it. And it's not useful for a lot of things. It's not useful for electronic exchange which is one of the reasons why it's now legal to trade in, right? It, it used to, it was illegal because it was, uh, you know, uh, a refuge from uh, fiat money, Sanyaraj. But um, now that that's not as important uh, because of global trade is largely electronic, uh, you know, it's, it's not a great money anymore. Uh, not, not for that scenario, right? So things change. Um, and things have changed historically many times, right, about what's the better money. Um, so... Uh, you know, gold is not, is not so great for smaller uh, um, value transactions, right? People mm -hmm. use, maybe use silver for that, right? Uh, it's not so great for moving through pipes or wires, and it's um, uh, maybe not so great for higher value transactions where people would use something else. So it, it's ideal for, you know, this certain scenario that was maybe perfect in the Middle Ages, I don't know, and it was, it's, it's still good for a lot of things. But but if people demanded it highly enough, other people would send ships out and mine asteroids or create plants to actually fabricate it, right? It's a question of demand, not just how much can be found laying around on the Earth's crust. So, and that's true for all products. Now, what's, what's really interesting about this is it's not true for Bitcoin, right? There, if, if for one chain of Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin has a fixed supply. Um, so uh, people look at that and they go, wow, this is absolutely unique. This is a thing. This has never existed in, 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 in the history of the universe, right? Even the universe is expanding all the time, right? I mean, there's conservation of mass energy. So maybe there's fixed supply of that, right? Um, we believe maybe that's true. So <clears throat> um, this, this leads people, first you take the fallacious assumption that value is created by scarcity. Um, we should even, we haven't even defined really scarcity clearly. And then you take this idea that, well, there's this thing that has fixed supply, which is incorrectly associated with the term scarcity. 
and then we can make these conclusions that, my God, there's no limit to its value to people, <laughs> right? These are all errors. Now, that doesn't mean I don't believe Bitcoin works. I, I believe very much Bitcoin works. I've, I've got my hands on, you know, a, an awful lot of Bitcoin code over the years. Um, uh, maybe half a million lines of, of, you know, core development type code. And uh, I wouldn't do that if I didn't think it was useful, right? Mm -hmm. But not everybody's perception of value is the same. <laughs> Mine's a little different, I think, than some people's. So we should, we should maybe back up and, and talk about scarcity. When, 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 and, and again, economics. These, we're not talking about financial terms. Uh, we're talking about economic terms. And we're not talking loosely. Economics is a proof. And praxology is literally uh, an axiomatic system of proof. <coughs> so formality matters. Um, now scarcity uh, is used in two ways. Uh, something that's scarce is property. Well, something that's scarce and valued is property. Something that is scarce and not valued by anybody does not become property because nobody, nobody demands it, right? It's a supply demand issue. So if there is effectively infinite supply and not supply of stuff you have to go get and manufacture, right? That's, that's still not supply. It's not supply until you can consume it or use it in the next step in a production process. So it's not a product. So when something's free, readily available, freely available as a product, something you consume um, with, with uh, effectively no limits, um, it doesn't become property. So people typically use air for this, right? But then there's clean air, dirty air, air for sale, you know, who knows, medical oxygen. But these are, these are kind of different products. But another one you could think of is maybe intellectual property. That's, that's public domain, right? There's, uh, um, it's freely available. There's no limit to its supply. Um, it's useful to people, they value it, um, but it doesn't become a product because it, it's not limited. So there's this clear distinction, or in some people's minds, there's no distinction. Everything um, is limited, right? That's one, one theory. But either everything is limited or everything's not, right? If everything's limited, everything um, becomes property as soon as somebody values it. If everything is not limited, um, then everything, uh, there is nothing that falls under the category of not property if it's valued. So um, even public domain intellectual property would be considered property <laughs> or public domain non-property, right? So, uh, um, but, so the point is there's this concept, uh, there's a binary concept of something that's freely available or not. Um, then there's this, uh, and that's, it's, not, it's not a measure of degree. It can't be more than infinitely freely available, right? You either are or you're not. So, um, once something that is not freely available becomes demanded for whatever reason, people gather it up, put fences around it, dig it up, put it in their pockets. Now it's their property. That's what creates property is the demand for those scarce, scarce we call them resources, right? But then, um, but then this is not a concept of how much there is, right? This is just a concept of whether it's property or not. You could equate the term uh, I call absolute scarcity with property, except it's not yet demanded, right? So then you have this concept of um, relative scarcity, which is kind of typically how scarcity is used in, in economics, where um, if, if there's a, if there's a, um, a hurricane coming in you know, South, Flor uh, South Florida and uh, all of a sudden you go to the store and there's no milk, right? Milk has just become scarce. Doesn't mean there's any less supply of it in the world than there was. It means that demand has increased. Okay, so demand determines scarcity as much as supply determines scarcity. Mm -hmm. You could think of, and scarcity doesn't, you know, that you can't say that milk is more scarce than water. It doesn't make any sense. It, milk can be, milk is more scarce than milk at another time. You can say it's getting more or less scarce. So, so this, this, this idea of scarcity is, is either an absolute, which basically defines um, the resources that can become property or scarcity as a relative, which defines the change in the supply-demand relation, which effectively is a change in price, but um, that's, that's a, a step a little bit too far. So, um, so where in here are we talking about how much of something there is on the earth or available to be produced, right? First of all, there is no limit to the amount of gold available to be produced, none. Right. Not okay. that we can find in the universe. Okay, I, need, I have a technical question. Okay, uh, let's say iron, copper, any other metal, would that be easier um, to produce or faster to produce other metals? In what, in what quantities? 
In, are we talking about the same weight, the same number of atoms? I mean, you know, these are these are important mm -hmm. concepts. You, you know, easier to, easier than what? Mm -hmm. Easier than the same weight of gold? Yeah, it'd be it'd be less costly than the same weight of gold. But are we, you know, are we talking about the same atoms of gold, the same market value of, of gold? You know, it would be exactly as easy to produce as gold mm -hmm. for the same market value, right? Yeah, a hundred dollars of copper is just as hard to produce as a hundred dollars of gold. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The difference is one's bigger. That's it. So, so this this concept of scarcity is a market concept. It's determined by both supply and demand. So then, tell me when I when I claim that something is rare on the earth, and I and I say, well, you know that then that determines demand <laughs> because it's scarce. What does that even mean, right? <laughs> It's, it's only rare in the market because demand has not risen. So if demand rises, if say the demand for gold for some reason doubles, maybe, maybe we're going to World War III, right? There's global conflict. People don't even think the internet's going to work, right? There's just, everybody wants to, to hold, hold on as much, hold on to as much stuff that they think will be valuable in the future as possible. Uh, so the market just doubles, right? The demand for gold, uh, you know, increases uh, that much. Well, what happens to supply? Let's say that demand is sustained over some period of time. What happens to supply? It will eventually get to the point, right? So now, now the, the market, the, 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 the reward for producing gold is now risen dramatically. And what causes that to fall? Competition. <laughs> so you get more and more and more people digging for gold, presumably, you know, roughly twice as much, probably more than that because there's, you know, diminishing returns. So you get all these people now digging for gold and eventually the supply of gold will increase to the point where it now costs just as much to produce as it, as it does as, as demand pays for it, right? Remember, prices are not a function of what it costs to produce something. Prices are a function of what people are willing to pay, what, how they value it. But eventually competition comes in, cr increases supply and reduces price. That's in gold, we refer to money or other things, we refer to that as inflation. Supply is increased. Therefore, the supply-demand relation has changed and, uh, you know, price will fall, even if demand has stayed the same. So gold will match demand, right? If the demand is, is high enough to, to, to cause there to be excess profit to be made, competition won't, except for um, state-created monopoly, right? Counterfeit laws, gold digging laws, maybe. So um, to me, that's, that's per, you know, it's a straightforward economic concept. Um, again, we have to we have to investigate this concept in Bitcoin because Bitcoin um, appears to be unique. Interestingly, we've already I have a topic called um, uh, the stability uh, property it talks about money in this way, and um, it talks about three kinds of monies. We've talked about two of them, you know, um, uh, commodity monies like gold and yeah, ar I call arbitrary supply monies like fiat. Um, I wrote this a long time ago, and that's not the word I would use anymore. I actually would just reduce this down to two kinds of um, money, but I keep it as three because people kind of see it this way, and they need to be need to be shown that fiat money and commodity money are really not fundamentally different as monies; they're fundamentally different by laws. Mm -hmm. um, because fiat's a commodity, like gold. I mean, I mean, a piece of paper with some certain script on it is, you know, is if it's it, if it can be validated, it can be uh, determined to be, um, you know, a money just like a gold could. So, but, but Bitcoin's different. And that's, that's what gives people some reason to think. And um, so we should probably, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess I've clarified my, my thinking on, um, on scarcity, the, the meaning of it, right? Not just the definition, but the meaningful interpretation of it. And of um, you know the supply demand re relation and the difference between commodity money and uh, fiat money, which to me are fundamentally the same except for the distinction of um, counterfeit laws. So <coughs> um, then you get into Bitcoin, which is the third type, which is which is different, right? Fixed supply. Well, um, and we're gonna I'm gonna stick strictly with the concept of Bitcoin, a single chain. Right? There's a lot of things which I consider Bitcoin. Anything that conforms to the principles that make that that, that make Bitcoin uh, itself, right? That secure it, um, are a Bitcoin. Like, I, for example, Litecoin is a Bitcoin. 
and it follows all the same principles as Bitcoin. The numbers, the times, the, the arbitrary numeric values in there are not defined in the white paper. They don't, Satoshi defined the term Bitcoin. So if he's authority on anything, he's authority on the definition of the term. Um, and so, so we have these principles that make Bitcoin what it is. And you can have more than one of them, uh, one of these chains, just like you could have more than one metal money, all right? So um, I'm, I'm gonna stick to just this one, one chain of Bitcoin, think of it as BTC if you want, um, which is actually you know, chains that fragment and uh, appear to be one over time. And um, talk about how it's different than uh, any other thing that we can value, right? There's a fixed supply of it. Now, I, I, the, the inflation schedule of Bitcoin, the, the, the distribution of units of coin, uh, I got another topic I wrote on this called the inflation fallacy. Um, the, the inflation of Bitcoin is completely irrelevant to you know, um, its valuation fundamentally uh, it, it, because it's all known ahead of time. And there's a, there's a great, uh, you know, um, so I, I derive this uh, kind of um, from fundamental principles in that, in that topic, but there's, a, there's also, you can observe it um, in the 80s, I believe in Israel, there was a, you know, hyperinflation basically, but it went on for years and it barely affected people after, after a while because it was so predictable. They just automatically cranked up prices every day and people's purchasing power remained pretty much the same. Okay. Now that's, that's not entirely true, but it's a, but it's a pretty good um, observation that that's a predictability of inflation um, um, eliminates its effect. So I'll give you an example. If I have a, if we make a loan and the loan has got a certain interest rate associated with it, um, you sell the loan, you discount against that interest rate. You know, you're going to have to pay it um, or you know, you're going to receive it one, one way or the other. Right. So, um, as a, uh, you don't ignore it, and if you do, it's just a math error, right? It's not, it's not like you're guessing on what it will be. So with predictable inflation, everything's discounted from the first purchaser of the coin. And Rothbard does an excellent job of explaining this concept um, in Man, Economy, and State. It's one of these things when you, when you read it a few times and, and you realize it, you, you realize you've learned something truly new, <laughs> at least I did. Um, and and not, not to do with money. He talks about this, and I, I want to delve into this for just a second. So we're, we're talking about... Um, in the, the inflation schedule in Bitcoin and its effect on value, right? It's a fixed inflation schedule, entirely predictable aside from the variability or the variance in block production. So, um, and that's um, it. Uh, the difficulty adjustment, the, the post I'm referring now to that post, you said the difficulty adjustment is only for maintaining the block period, like every 10 minutes, right? It doesn't yeah, blocks have any faster or slower if, it, if you didn't have a difficulty adjustment. Yeah, and then yeah, but your sec second sentence was uh, sort of it, the difficult adjustment is not uh, the, you know has does not refer to the to the inflation to the inflationary the difficulty adjustment doesn't exist to manage inflation. It exists to maintain the block period, and that should be pretty obvious in the fact that the difficulty adjustment continues after inflation is over. Right? So why do we have it? Yeah, it's, it's to maintain the block period. The allocation of coins through inflation is piggybacking on the block production schedule. Right. And Satoshi, I think, even said, and again, Satoshi is only an authority on his opinions, but, but it's interesting that he said, you know, it's, it's as good as method as any. Right? He wanted to just get the coins out there. And again, another interesting Austrian economic principle, you know, if you have this kind of misallocation of wealth that's been caused by some aggression, say communism, right, or whatever form of statism you want. Um, and then it just kind of goes away and people are like, well, all the rich people got the money. It's going to be that way forever. And, and, you know, the theory is, uh, that that's not possible. Uh, people have to spend that money eventually makes its way out into the market and, and balances itself out pretty easily. And that's kind of the way, you know, you would think of Bitcoin distribution, even if it wasn't fair, which is mm -hmm. not definable, right? Uh, it wouldn't really matter to the money. Um, so fairness is really, you know, not the goal, uh, getting money out in some rational way um, is was a goal of Satoshi's uh, but you know you've seen coins do airdrops and all kinds of strange things you know pre-mining uh, pre is not really technically different but you know there's lots of ways you can get coin out to people and then okay start the money the money doesn't depend on the inflation schedule so going back again to the effects of a of a of a predictable inflation rate 
uh, I recommend again, uh, Man Economy in the State by Rothbard is a, a fundamental economics tome. If you, if you, but you have to kind of advance economically before you can even follow it. Um, not that it's hard reading. It's just that there's principles there that you have to take time to, to absorb. And so anyway, um, he talks about it in terms of taxation, um, where predictable tax schedule, right? Well, they're the same thing. There's a percentage change in the value of something that's um, that's coming from some outside force and, and the value of that thing is absorbing it, right? So I, you can equate the two. He doesn't, but, but in my mind, that's where I get this inflation fallacy uh, topic. So if you're a property owner, this is the example he uses, you're a property owner, you have, you have some land and um, you, know, you have a certain tax, you, say you have no property tax on that land and the land is market valued you know, at a, at a, million, a million dollars. And then one day the state steps in and says, no, 10% annual tax. Mm -hmm. So who pays that tax? Future buyers, you know, renters, current owner. Only the current owner pays that tax, <laughs> right? They're yeah. really interesting concept. So every time a tax is levied, a, new, a change is made to the tax law, all the, uh, say property tax, all the property owners immediately pay that tax. And that's it. It's been paid. <laughs> because at, from that point forward, um, the the value of the property has dropped by the amount of the tax rate. Everybody calculates in the amount of tax they're going to have to pay on it every year, yeah. which means property sells to the next buyer after the first owner, the next buyer pays less, right? The property is now worth less. And so they never paid the full price of the property. They paid the net present value of the property, assuming an, you know, an infinite progression of 10% annual tax. Okay. So they, they have that money that they didn't spend on the value of the property and they put that money in and earn, you know, a market rate of return on that money because it's been de depreciated for, um, it's not being paid to the future. Right. And then they, they accumulate interest to the point where when they pay the future, they pay nothing. <laughs> right. So, so, so if you, if you, if, if, and it doesn't matter whether people know this or not, it doesn't matter where the second buyer thinks about it. Right. People mm -hmm. tell me this all the time. Well, I never thought about it when I bought my Bitcoin that there was this inflation thing and I was going to do it. It doesn't matter. Right. The value of the property is the value of the property on the market or the price of the property is the price of the property on the market because people do consider these things in the aggregate. So when a miner, the miner is the first buyer of a Bitcoin, right, does some work, pays for the coin in that work. And the miner knows that the, 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 the time period for which he holds this coin it's going to lose, lose, it's going to be, the supply is going to be increased. So the supply demand relation is going to change, therefore affecting its value. Not necessarily affecting its price, but affecting its, its supply demand relation. So um, in other words, um, uh, I, I'll just leave it at that. So, so but then let's just say he forks it off on somebody else that's going to, um, you know, plans to sell it immediately after 100, um, 100 um, blocks have passed in, in Bitcoin uh, anyway, BTC. And uh, then he's able to sell it. Well, that's a point at which it becomes under his control. He sells it. Um, and, you know, what if the other next person doesn't know that this is happening? Well, then they're just overpaying, right? <laughs> because it is going to happen. So um, th that's a math error. Um, but the market doesn't make those types of errors. If, if, you, look at, if you look at prices when things are taxed, they, they, they're affected. And inflation inflation's the same way. If the state announced that it was going to tax at an annual inflation rate of 10% and rigidly stuck to that, which pretty much happened in Israel for a long period of time with a very high inflation rate, the inflation rate would not have an effect on people because they would, it would be discounted out um, uh, immediately. So there would, there would still be a wealth transfer going on, right? Uh, because the state would still be printing the money and um, consuming properties produced in that money. Um, and not, tr not essentially not trading for them, right? So it's still a tax on the holder on the holder of the money. But who? The question is who pays the tax, right? Um, and that's that's what, what I was getting at. Um, so Rothbard makes that very clear. I highly recommend that to anybody. Um, it's a proof, so I'm not appealing to his authority, but to his uh, to his written proof. Um, so what we have in Bitcoin is a situation where um, the allocation schedule is known to everybody, and so inflation is a non-issue. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's, it's predetermined. It's set in stone, as Satoshi said. Set said, in stone. Right? The money's already right. been depreciated for that effect, and people who buy the money have already got that benefit, um, an offsetting benefit. Right. So um, that's why we just don't, you know, people don't care about it, right? <laughs> and they shouldn't. 
it's not, it's not, so inflation, and this is one of the questions I was trying to get at when you very first opened, what is, you know, when we talk about the good versus the bad of inflation, well, the bad is inflation's a tax. A tax is a taking, an aggression, right? Yeah. Um, you're, you're compelled, uh, well, if you, if you have some property, which is this money that you've earned, it's yours, and somebody uh, takes it from you, it's, uh, it's a theft. And if the state does it, it's called a tax. And it's a legalized it's theft. So to put it bluntly, it's a legalized theft. I mean, it's well, what sort is it of an oxymoron, but, but socially yeah. theft, uh, legally it's taxation, right? Um, <laughs> depending on what concept you're using for law, natural law or whatever, but, but if you say social law, right? Natural law, it's theft because it's an aggression. Um, according to the statute, it's legal. So it's called taxation. Mm -hmm. But it's not a direct taking. You don't come into your house and pull it out of your pocket. Um, it, it's it's taken through um, um, the state monopoly on uh, on money on that money. So a state monopoly is itself an aggression, um, and that's the source of the taxation. So so um, okay. So you've got taxation, which is bad because it's aggression. It's a theft of people's property, and. Um, which is manifested through a bunch of different laws and techniques, but, but that's fundamentally what boils down to. And in, and in Bitcoin, what you have um, in terms of the supply schedule, the distribution of units of coin out to people, you've got a situation which is much akin to a, um, so I, I've done a number of startups and done, you know, stock and uh, stock issuances or uh, what do you call them? Uh, debt contracts, uh, equity contracts, convertibles, um, you know, for raising money. And so what you do is you allocate a certain amount of stock. Um, sorry, you authorize, the board will authorize a certain amount of stock when you create the company. And then it'll, it'll authorize distribution of um, that stock uh, allocation to people for, you know, exchange for money. So in Bitcoin, it's very much like you've got a uh, certain, you know, 21-ish million units of authorized stock. Everybody knows it's sitting there in the stock pool. Um, and it's being issued to people, not on a schedule that's determined by market forces like in a company, but on a predictable, at a predictable rate until it's all used up. So uh, if everybody knows that that company stock is all that, that's been authorized is all going to be issued at some point, what do they assume when they sell the stock, right? When, when they hold it for some amount of time, right? They assume the dilution in that, in that, in that stock that they're holding. Mm -hmm. And that's all calculated out ahead of time in any trade that's ever done. Um, so Bitcoin is very much the same way. The stock's all been authorized and it's being allocated on a, on a predictable schedule. So people know what their dilution is and they calculate that out when they buy it in the first place. They have to. Um, so, so, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. The... Rate the, of inflation. Okay, so the, the effect, the effect on uh, in Bitcoin of, of the issuance is non-inflationary mm -hmm. in terms of uh, it's it's not just non uh, price inflation. It's not monetary inflation. It's not increasing the supply. The supply is fixed. It's not growing at a fixed rate. Exactly. So um, um, changes in that rate that it's actually being distributed at have no effect. They don't matter, right? Because they don't matter economically because um, they've all been factored in. And I wrote another topic on a while back, um, had to do with the halving. There's a theory that's been put forth every time there's a halving, you know, it's like, it's like a full moon, there, you know, there's, there's all this hand wringing over what's going to happen and whatever, you know, and, and nothing happens. Um, price just keeps doing kind of, I mean, nothing observable happens um, that's detrimental as a result of this. Well, why is that? Because people have already known this is coming. Mm -hmm. um, just, just as people factor in known taxes that are going to come, known future costs, known future revenues in business, people factor in whether they know it or not. They're factoring in uh, known supply changes, and so it doesn't have any effect. Um, can you so, deduce? Can you deduce every anything out of history from the Bitcoin history in the instances where the halving occurred? I mean, is there any kind of pattern you see? I don't. Or, I don't or know, not sorry, at all. I don't know what you're asking. I, I, and it's not that I don't see it. I don't know what you're asking. No, you know, this guy, Plan B, with his article on the halving, his analysis, do you see any kind of pattern uh, from the inception of Bitcoin and the halvings that have, that have occurred until now? I mean, is there any kind of price patterns? There's or... a pattern of issuance, which is in the code. I can see that in the code, right? <laughs> yeah. 
there's but a that's certain, it. There's a, there's a certain rate of issuance which is which is um, controlled um, by the block issuance schedule, um, coincidentally. But again, th there's no economic impact um, due to things that are already known, right? They've already been fact necessarily been factored in. So the theory that having it, you know, creates some change in the supply demand schedule is, is just irrelevant. Is is incorrect, and um, so you know, miners have to plan for this. They have planned for it. They know it's coming. Anybody who knows a tax is coming plans for it. Mm -hmm. And again, if a tax changes, the person owning the thing that's being taxed at the time of the change pays the tax. But nobody owned Bitcoin before the point where it's, it's full schedule was all, all known. So nobody's paying that tax. They're just buying something they know depreciates at a certain rate or you know, depreciate and using the term loosely. So if, if everybody who's bought big, it's like everybody's buying debt contracts and everybody knows the de, that, that the rate is 10%. It's been factored into the price, right? Mm -hmm. This is a simple economic principle. It's not difficult. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, calculating, calculating bond uh, you know, valuations and things like that can be mathematically challenging and not necessarily obvious, but these are not new questions. Um, they're just misapplying, you know, there's, there's new people misapplying um, theory, right? And, and it's I think it's, you know, smart people, but the, the thing is that the theory, I, I'm, I tend to be good at abstraction, right? And sometimes it's not obvious that this theory applies in this scenario. So we've got this scenario, I'm talking about taxation, right? You know, or, or bond issuance or whatever. And then there's this technology called Bitcoin, which people who work in code, you know, know, and, and, they, and they don't, Maybe they don't know one, maybe they don't know both, or maybe they just not able to make the connection. But, you know, this is not a new economic principle. So, uh, nor is stock to flow, nor is inflation. None of these are new concepts. Um, the, the, the difficulty has been applying those concepts, um, you know, the community applying those economic principles to Bitcoin. Um, or, you know, the community. I so said there's Bitcoin people who tend to be more technologists, I guess, at least from my perspective. Um, applying economic theory or economists applying theory to Bitcoin, which is another problem because economists don't understand Bitcoin. They don't understand the technology or the, and I'm sorry, I'm speaking too broadly, but this is kind of a, just yeah, trying to get the point. Of yeah, you're why talking about this, the, this, yeah, you're talking about the Keynesianist uh, <laughs> economists. I'm, I'm talking about sound Austrian economists, which I would Oh, really? Okay. Right? You take uh -huh. your understanding of economics uh -huh. and, you know, can be a complete, full, perfect understanding of economics, but trying to apply it to Bitcoin can be challenging if you don't understand how Bitcoin actually works. For example, mm -hmm. you don't understand the security model of Bitcoin, right? You can see the money and hear what people say about it, but if you don't understand the security model, you will make assumptions that will be incorrect. If you don't understand the technology, you'll make assumptions that will be correct, incorrect. So it, it's challenging for those two communities of people who can be perfectly good at mm -hmm. whatever they do to apply their knowledge in this other domain. Um, and I think that's why we see a lot of these debates going on about how things work and how things don't work. There's just not a lot of people that span both domains. And, and I certainly don't, I'm not an economist, but I spent a lot of time, you know, decades um, trying to teach myself. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I could be if you didn't, you know, the degree wasn't required. Um, I do have a, I do have a CS degree, but, but uh, I don't even consider myself, you know, a uh, computer scientist. That's uh, kind of stuff that's way beyond me. So um, anyway, uh, you know, we, we got, we got through the question of, you know, the effects of inflation. Um, but then there's this, there's this remaining question. I think you had, we were talking about scarcity. Um, Hardness, scarcity, scarcity and so yeah. You know, what's hardness? <sighs> what's hardness? Not, if you look up the properties of money that are generally accepted, you won't see hardness. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Well, until now, I mean, now now you're pretty, you know, confusing me because <laughs> to be honest, because it was, you know, I thought it's okay. Fiat money is easy money, you know, everything that you can just, you know, infinitely out of nothing, out of thin air, as they say, literally but you produce. You can do that with gold. You can do that with gold. You can make gold out of air. Yeah, but then <laughs> I have. Yeah, but then I have one question. Why has? Why do the central banks? Uh, uh, nearly, I mean, at, at least I know from the Russian central banks, central banks, and the other central banks have been not only hoarding but accumulating now more and more in the last weeks, months, and years. 
hundreds and hundreds of tons of gold. Why? What's what's the motive it's behind it? It's valued. But what's the intention behind it? What's the motive? What's the purpose? They want to be able to. They want to be able to spend it in the future. So, so they able to trade it with with people in the future, people that value it. So but, that, you know, they value with, it for. With the intention of manipulating the price, or or, or I don't you know. I don't. When people use the term manipulate price, you know, I don't know what they mean. Well, price to raise the, the price. I mean, long term, why why would I buy gold now in order to to uh, to to keep the purchase or to at least you know keep the purchasing power in the future, right? Well, that, why is that called manipulating? People buy things for whatever reason they want. Remember, value is subjective, mm -hmm. right? So I value something. I buy it because I value it. Maybe I buy it. Be maybe I value it because by buying it, I raise the price. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's, that's just buying, right? They're buying gold because they want to, and nobody, you know, nobody questions the motives of of, of other buyers. Like, you know, why are you buying cars? Right? I, I don't. Know. Mm -hmm. If you're, but if you're buying strictly to raise the price of something, if you know, when you sell, you'll, you know, you'll you'll reduce the price presumably, but Buying doesn't necessarily raise the price. You know, other people have to have to continue to value it at the same level that they did before. You know, price can drop when you when you buy large amounts. Um, or you could buy large amounts, nothing can happen, and then the price could drop and rise over the years, which is generally what happens. So people are we're, we're talking about speculation, right? When mm -hmm. when economically there's three types of the savings is an umbrella category for three things. Hoarding, which means like a squirrel holding nuts, right? It just you, you have a pile there under your direct control. Speculating, which is exactly like hoarding, except you're doing it with an expectation of price change to your advantage. So it's mm -hmm. completely, the distinction is completely in the person's mind. Mm -hmm. And investing, which is um, relinquishing control of your asset to somebody else in exchange for a contract, um, which gives you rights to their, a fraction of their future earnings or a fraction of their business. Right, so you've actually parted with it. You've sold it in exchange for a contract. Um, so um, um, speculation is speculation and investing are economically very different things. Financially, they get lumped into the same term, right? Uh, speculation and investment, and then people confuse hoarding with savings because they think they're hoarding when they put their money into an interest-bearing savings account. Yeah. They're not. They're investing, right? Um, because banks don't typically speculate too much. They tend to be more investors, lenders of the money. But if to the extent the bank is speculating, they're also speculating, right? So, um, so this idea of, you know, buying something with uh, the expectation that it increases in, in, you know, in purchasing power in the future uh, is what we call speculation. And that expectation is based on a fundamental assumption that the price is incorrect today, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise the future changes that people know will happen for some reason haven't been factored into the current price so um there is no reason to believe that any price today is incorrect unless you have knowledge that the market doesn't have which is rarely the case this is why speculation over time is a zero-sum game right the person who guesses right wins the person who guesses wrong loses the person who's you know kind of doing it for uh you know for a living breaks even um, with the typically, and this is actually observable, with the difference being they make um, the amount they make the amount of return that's basically equal to the value of their labor they put in. So it's essentially a zero sum game, right? You haven't, um, but there are some people that historically tend to do better at it than others, but it can't be proven that it's because they're skilled. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the, you know the efficient market hypothesis, right? And uh, it's one of the things that's been studied kind of more than <laughs> just about anything else out there. You know how how uh, how how effective people are at predicting prices. Because what you're saying when you're predicting prices is you're determining at this moment that prices are incorrect, right? So who who knows why why somebody buys something with the expectation of its price changing in the future? Um, <coughs> so there are people that will will try to convince you that you know Bitcoin's price can only go in one direction. I'll tell them they're wrong. But um, predicting price is a different question, mm -hmm. right? Predicting that it can only go in one direction is a very different idea than predicting what it will be. Um, so I think that gets closer to the, you know, the actual underlying you know, theme, you know, when we're talking about this, this question of scarcity, when I was, what is the future price? That's what people care about when they're watching yeah. your price, right? What's the price going to be? Um, 
so we, we should go back to this idea of Bitcoin as a unique type of property mm-hmm. um, because it has fixed, not inflationary supply. Mm-hmm. Um, that just put that not inflationary parentheses as a covered topic. But so fixed supply versus um, call it commodity supply, right? Free market supply. Um, can't go out and um, find more Bitcoin, you know, even if I can uh, surf the stars. Um, I can find things that are pretty darn close. So we get into this other question of substitutes, right? Gold has substitutes, but they're not almost identical to gold, right? They're mm-hmm. silver, it's pretty close, and this other. But Bitcoin substitutes can get very, very, very close. And to the point where the distinction could be nothing more than the exchange cost. I mean, there's no distinction. There's two identical things that have nothing but an exchange cost between them. So Bit, what, what people tend to miss is that not only does Bitcoin have this very unique characteristic of being the, the one property that um, does not expand in quantity, it's also got some other unique characteristics, which are not always so um, so positive to uh, people's idea of what, like, you know, what future price would be. Um, so some people will claim, well, you know, there could never be another BTC chain that would have the same characteristics and the same developer quality and the same... You know, that's nonsense. Right? That's possible. Feasible? Who knows? But definitely possible, and you can't. <laughs> nobody can prove that otherwise. So the value of the money is uh, determined by you know supply and demand, and ultimately there's no value in the money that nobody demands, which means if you have no merchants, you have no value, right? Nobody that accepts it. So I'm not talking about merchants in the kind of lay person sense. I'm talking about anybody. Who, so anybody who's buying dollars for Bitcoin is a merchant in that mm-hmm. sense. So. Um, the size of your economy, which I refer to as a set of all merchants who accept the money at any given time, determines the value of the uh, 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 determines uh, the value in the money. Ultimately, if you can't sell it to anybody, if you can't trade it for anything, it's valueless. Now, your the price is different, right? The price of the money, the, the amount that will be buy and sell, uh, is uh, is a term of, is a function of supply and demand. But the value is subjective, and it's determined by all those people who are willing to accept it. If nobody accepts gold, it's worthless, literally. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, okay, so you've got this possibility of substitutes in gold that are much close uh, in, in Bitcoin that are much closer than they are in gold. So that's something to consider, and I'll set that aside. Um, so we talk about gold as being non-inflatable, um, fixed supply, and we ignore the effects of substitutes for, for gold and, and Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin has this unique characteristic of fixed supply. So as demand increases, um, supply stays the same, price increases. That's, that's a market necessity, right? The amount that we'll trade for increases. And so people take this very simple relation and go, well, price will go up forever as long as demand is increasing. That's a big asterisk, right? Yeah. So um, now gold, as, as demand increases, supply will increase to match that demand. Um, so gold has this effect, which creates stability. And I wrote another topic called, I think I referenced this one already, the stability property, Mm -hmm. right? The stability of money is a usefulness, right? It's useful that money have stability and in, in an engineering, I'm referring to stability in the engineering context where, um, it's, uh, when disturbed, it tends to return to an equilibrium point, not in the. Uh, often misused financial context, which is basically equating it with volatility, right? The mm-hmm. tendency to uh, volatility is standard deviation from the norm. That's how we define financial volatility. So you have two very different concepts: a standard deviation from the norm, tend, you know, ten, tendency to deviate from some point, um, and and then a tendency to return to the norm or not, um, or or. Uh, so, so, which is which is st- so stability and volatility are not opposites, right? Mm-hmm. They're two different orthogonal concepts. Uh, so, so in Bitcoin, I mean, sorry, in gold, you have stability produced by inflation. As price goes up, I'm uh, sorry, I should say, as demand increases, um, which Im- increases profit to miners, um, c- competition enters because they're getting a higher rate of return than market on capital, which increases supply which brings uh, the increase in supply brings price down and therefore uh, stops the increasing advantage of, of mining and uh, su- supply stabilizes. Therefore, price tends to stabilize, right? So because there's a negative pressure on price, 
because of increasing supply when demand increases. So what happens in Bitcoin? When demand increases, <coughs> there is not this negative increase on negative um, pressure on price due to increasing supply, right? But that would imply Bitcoin's an unstable money, which is not a worthy goal, right? We don't want mm -hmm. unstable money. We want money that is useful as a unit of account. We, we want to be able to predict um, more reasonably um, some equilibrium point around which we can make financial projections. So I, I, I don't even understand why this is a goal for people, right? That just have infinitely, you know, per perpetually increasing um, price because it would not be a very good money. Um, is it about the purchasing power? I mean, you know, I want to have sort of the, I don't know, a hundred times, thousand times the, the, the purchasing power of today's whatever dollar uh, in one Bitcoin. Uh, that, that's, that's the thing. Okay, let's go back to the supply and demand. Uh, right now we have approximately 70 million or 100 million uh, people owning or, or whatever, hoarding, hodling uh, Bitcoin or Satoshis. So what if, my question I think is, what if by whatever, by the year 2024, 25, there are, it's not realistic, maybe. Right, well, maybe we have three to four billion people um, holding. Just, just what happens if demand increases? That's, that's what you're saying. Exactly. What happens if demand yeah. that, that's the point I'm, I'm, I'm getting to. What, what <laughs> we should realize is that, that um, the number of units of the money is irrelevant as long as it's divisible, right? Mm -hmm. So 21 million, 100 million, completely arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And you know, Satoshi recognized this. So what, what I'm what I'm saying is that um, it doesn't matter to the money that the price is, is is you know increases forever. That just means that one unit buys this versus twice that, right? Well, okay, so mm -hmm. no units buys twice that. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, money is useful um, uh, as a unit of account because it has this stability property. Now, speculators who want to bet, which is strictly gambling, right, on price change, because they have no knowledge of the market that the market doesn't already have, um, speculators want to see their price go up. So they want, they want the unstable money, which is a bit contradictory when you think about goals for Bitcoin, right? Speculators have this goal of instability, and, and uh, Bitcoiners, maybe rare like myself, have this goal of um, a stable money and money that returns to equilibrium that main, you know, maintains its unit of account property. Um, now, it's not that objective that puts my observation in place. It was my observation that made me realize that that objective was achievable, you know, that that, that that property of money would exist, but it wasn't like a goal for me to go find that. I discovered it. And and uh, so it, it always kind of bothered me that um, this theory that by simply buying a Bitcoin and waiting for, I don't know, 10, 20, 100 years, you'd be ungodly rich, right? Your purchasing power, not just the amount of purchasing power you started with would be retained, but you would become, you know, this crazy rich, right? Yeah. And that would happen to everybody. Let's just say everybody had one Bitcoin. It's all been allocated, you know, through some kind of birthright and then boom. We just oh, that's cool. Yeah, I wrote that in my article, it's birthright, yeah. <laughs> but it's a completely irrational idea. There's been, there's no assumption of increased production in there. Mm -hmm. And it's only, the, it's only increased production that makes society more wealthy. Now, there'll be people that argue, well, hard money will increase production. Um, that's you know, not necessarily the case, right? That's an assumption. There's taxation in soft money, but there's always been taxation, and there always will be taxation. So the, the idea that hard money will change this or that it will change people's um, – I mean, I'm using hard money uh, the, you know, loosely because it's an ill-defined term – but it will change people's time preference. It's also a gross economic error. There's nothing that we, there's nothing you can say changes people's time preference. It's a preference. It's human. It's in your mind, right? Mm -hmm. Having having more property may you know increase your uh, may may decrease your time preference. It may not. Mm -hmm. um, but but the rate of economic growth globally as a result of people using Bitcoin should not be expected to change dramatically. <laughs> Right. It's been constant throughout periods of time of relatively hard money uh, and other periods of time throughout history. I mean, we're talking about the long arc of history. Um, economic growth is, you know, compounding production and it tends to contract with wars and, you know, things, things that are highly destructive of capital. But in the long arc, it's pretty, pretty, pretty steady. So uh, compounding, accelerating, but, but, mm -hmm. but, but predictable. Um, 
or at least uh, I shouldn't say predictable because I don't actually believe um, but the the idea of of economic growth is people building tomorrow with the with the capital of today so that compounds on itself right um, money you know as a medium of exchange store value whatever facilitates trade and production all this stuff but the facilitation is a tax reduction <laughs> that's what it is right mm -hmm. it's it's its ability to avoid tax by hiding your transactions, and it's the ability to avoid tax through inflation. Um, you know, so let's be generous and say that you know Bitcoin eliminates tax, and we go to having greater productivity. Okay, so there'll be a somewhat of an improvement in productivity, but the world will could keep producing things and go on forever. Okay, well. How does it hold then that as this happens and demand continues to and continues to increase with all this new productivity, everybody that's doing nothing is getting ungodly wealthy, right? It's 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 an irrational premise, and this mm -hmm. this idea of a fixed supply has never existed before, so people have never been able to observe it before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you hold something like gold, and its stability property tends to allow it to maintain a equilibrium value over time, which is very observable. You look back at the long arc of history and you see gold has got a purchasing power that's you know remarkably constant. And it's held constant by that fact of increasing supply when demand increases. So with Bitcoin, if you have a money that gets more and more and more and more costly over time, uh, as people use it, there's consequences. And the consequences turn out to be effectively the same as they are with gold. With gold, when you have increasing demand, supply increases create stability. With Bitcoin, you have increasing demand to transact, which is, gold doesn't have a transaction process, right? I can just hand it to you and it doesn't cost me anything. Mm -hmm. But Bitcoin, every time somebody transacts, the price of transacting in Bitcoin for everybody else, else goes up. So in other words, the more demand there is, the less useful it becomes. So um, now people say, well, there's lightning and there, you know, blocks can get bigger and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but there's still a fixed amount of, uh, there will always necessarily be a limited amount of transaction ability that will have to be paid for or nobody minds it, right? So, so this need to pay based on demand, right? Demand, the demand determines the cost of, determines the uh, energy consumed in mining, right? It determines the work produced in mining, not miners right demand determines that and then they supply it and then they compete to reduce the profit from supply to market rate of capital and so and i shouldn't say then this is all kind of happens based on people's assumptions and predictions about the future but it's easier for people to see it as a sequence of events so let me understand you correctly so the fees uh, like whatever on whatever lightning second layer or third layer would exponentially increase too by with exponential demand or uh, how, how does it work i mean the, the fee demand increases exponentially fees increase exponentially so I mean, it, who's going to afford that so the question is who, who can afford that i mean can the average person afford right so it's now we're asking the right questions right so so let's let's first settle let's first settle this question of whether lightning or any other layer solution solves this problem right let's just say we can transact practically infinitely on Bitcoin without an increase in fees, right? Um, so we have this extraordinary increase in price of Bitcoin, which we're assuming, but, um, you know, my, minor reward doesn't go up. Well, people will say, well, we, if we do a layer solution, then mining reward will go up, right? Um, but the cost of individual transactions will go down. Yes, but there's still a limit right? It's like the uh, Earth's ability to hold in its atmosphere. What happens is as you move away from the Earth, you get less gas because gravity decreases. And what happens when you get away from the main chain is you get less Bitcoin. Lightning is not Bitcoin. It uses Bitcoin transactions, but there's a trade-off in security. Mm -hmm. and, there, and there are costs for running it because you must settle back on the chain. You have to monitor. There's re so, so you're making these trade-offs and you're still paying the fees ultimately somewhere. Mm -hmm. So those fees percolate down, or I should say they percolate up, right, um, from the lower layer to the higher layers. And as you get further away from the chain, you can do more transacting, you reduce security even more. Now maybe you're just Coinbase. A lot of so-called Bitcoin transactions happen on Coinbase. They never hit the chain, they're not secure, but people make that trade-off, right? That's a substitute for using Bitcoin. It's not Bitcoin itself. 
So people, people start to use substitutes when it gets too costly. And that's the point, right? So fees drive the cost and fees are necessary for, for censorship resistance in Bitcoin. So whole nother topic on security, but if you don't understand the security of Bitcoin, which many people fail to do, they won't understand that fees are necessary and that um, Bitcoin has this aspect of costliness increasing as demand increases. No matter how much you thin out that demand and move away from the chain, um, there is a limit, just like there's a limit to the Earth's ability to hold in the atmosphere. At some point, you get so far away from the chain that Bitcoin's doing nothing for you, right? So as you get closer, it becomes more costly. So, so okay, so now we, what we have is with increasing demand, we have not increasing supply to bring down price, we have decreasing demand to bring down price. Increasing demand creates decreasing demand, versus with everything else, increasing demand creates decreasing supply. Mm -hmm. Now, that, I, should, I shouldn't say that's entirely true with everything else. Say you're going to you know, a concert, see some, see some uh, big name, and uh, big names, you know, they're great, but they're, they're still small, so you can see them in some small venue. That's worth a lot, right? That's awesome. Um, and then all of a sudden they're playing stadiums, right? Well, you know, you're not, you're not really seeing the same thing anymore. It's the, the increased demand has actually reduced your demand, right? So, I mean, it's, one, it's an abstract, it's not really a perfect analogy because what's actually happening is the product is changing. But, but, but you, can, you can see the analogy, right? It's an interesting thing where increasing demand decreases demand versus increasing demand decreasing supply. You know, in music, you have increasing demand, more supply comes in, right? But if you have increasing demand for one thing that there's no more supply of, demand gets decreased um, because it becomes unpopular, because it's too popular, or because you can't get a front row seat, because it's, you know, too many people up there. So um, it's a good way to think about it anyway. So Bitcoin has this stability property. People say, well, where is it? What's the price? I don't know. That's, you know, that's not provable. It's not knowable. <laughs> that's not the point. The point is that it has a limit. Um, and what happens is as, as uh, fees rise on the chain, the ability to use the main chain for anything um, of, of, a, of a certain price goes away. It becomes less usable. Um, that's good, called the threshold principle. The threshold rises as more people are using it. So all of a sudden, you know, when price went to 20,000 overnight US, um, all people were hand wringing over the fact that they had to shut down all these systems that were relying on low fee transactions, mm -hmm. right? It, it can't do it anymore, yeah. So now demand is going away, right? We saw visible signs of demand going away. And by the way, probably, you know, reasonable to um, at least uh, theorize that the drop in price was in response to the fact that, wow, 20, you know, whatever, $20 transaction fees, this thing's useless, right? Okay, so, you know, people will just continue to point to lightning as if they will, you know, this, this effect goes away. That's just, it's not the case. What we're doing is making um, essentially uh, trade-offs with substitutes for making, you know, even though we're still using Bitcoin transactions. So um, what do people do when price rises on something for which they have demand? You can't get a front row seat at that concert, but there's somebody else that's playing, they're pretty good, you go there, right? You go to the substitute, uh, or you don't go at all. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin has this other characteristic of being very um, possible to substitute to a very close degree. Now, again, I, I, I disagree with people who say that's not possible. Once Bitcoin reaches the point where it's kind of, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's reached this equilibrium point, which I, I don't really personally will believe it has. But again, this is price prediction. I don't do that, but um, uh, at least from a professional standpoint. But um, anybody who owns something is, is uh, you know, assuming something about a future price, mm -hmm. future value to themselves. So. Um, but, but predicting it, um, you know, it, it is, is hard in the, you know, in the true sense of hard. So, okay. But, so, but, but, would, but, um, Eric, would it be realistic to say that, I mean, uh, whatever, like what, what would be critical, uh, is there, is there in, from your perspective, a critical mass adoption? Like, is there a number to it? Like 2 billion people, 3 billion people or half of well, we're starting to, we're starting to get into questions of the security model of Bitcoin which is another long topic and maybe we should save for another podcast <laughs> because, yeah. because mass adoption is not, you know, so Bitcoin itself doesn't have objectives, right? It's just a, it's just a program. And yeah. so people, 
you know, people that have objectives. But yeah, exactly. I found this quote in your article, or I don't know, in that Cloudbed article, really interesting. Um, where should I start? It says here, Bitcoin is not secured by blockchains, hash power, validation, decentralization, cryptography, open source, or game theory. It is secured by people. Technology is never the root of system security. Technology is a tool to help people secure what they value. Security requires people to act. I found it pretty profound is that because it goes to the essence of this whole discussion, right? Well, yeah, and this is this kind of derives from my background in security, both in you know national security, personal, you know my my mm -hmm. my, my, my military training, my martial arts training. It's just like it's, it's just a basic principle to me. It's not profound. Right? Why do why do people study hand to hand combat? I mean, it's it's good exercise and all that stuff, but but really, you know, um, people provide the root of security. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your 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 locked door in your house doesn't secure your house at all. Right? It's a, it's it's a tool to help your neighbors, you know, hear the break in so they can stop. It, right? <laughs> that's that's it. I mean, an alarm in your car doesn't stop the theft of your car. Right. If there's nobody around, you just take the car. Um, you know, the firewall does not secure your network. If somebody walks into your house and unplugs your firewall. You have no firewall. Who stops that? What stops that? People stop that. You know, dogs mm -hmm. don't stop. They just shoot the dog. Right. I mean, <laughs> ultimately, society is what's providing security, individual people and groups of people. And to do that, they have to put themselves at personal risk. Somebody has to be the one that goes over to your house when you're getting broken into and stops that. Mm -hmm. People don't think about these. They're just abstractions, right? Security, you know, but to me, these are real things. Um, you know, when you, when you carry a gun, you carry bombs, you know, you, you, you realize that it's not the plane you know, that's providing the security you are. Um, and you're a decision maker. You're out there. You have choices to make, putting your, putting yourself at risk. And when people use Bitcoin, um, if, when people assume security in Bitcoin, they assume some technology is doing it. I've got a node. My node secures it. No. Your node is nothing but a tool to help you secure it. What secures it is the fact that when, you know, people come marching in your front door and saying you're money laundering, you know, you, you defend yourself. Right? The node doesn't do that for you. The node is just a tool. It tells you whether something's valid or not. It's not providing you security. So this question of, of um, how, you know, this question of uh, mass adoption to me is always kind of interesting mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. of whether the market will go black market and, and mass, right? That's what it, that's what you're really asking. So if you're asking me when the market will go black market, you know, when, when humanity will go black market and mass, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I don't usually like to make predictions about when or how much things happen. Um, it's, there's a certain large percentage of the market right now of all, you know, of all markets that is black market. But you you're talking about when you when you talk about black market, you mean like whatever it's called, black market, blue market. But you oh, talk about okay. transacting, like in, transacting or buying, selling whatever goods or services oh, with okay. illegal, illegal, right? Yeah, so trading things that are regulated without paying the taxes. Okay. You know, okay. Um, crossing borders that you're not allowed to cross. Mm -hmm. you know, or, or, that's not. Sorry, that was a bit, bit, bit of a misplaced analogy, but uh, or example. Um, but basically, do, do, doing. Uh, when we talk about black market trade, we're talking about people trading in ways that make them criminal, mm -hmm. minor or major, right? Yeah. If you're breaking the law in trading, you're a black market trader. This is a just I use the term black and white because people traditionally have used those terms. You can use whatever you want, right? I don't use like to use the term lawful and unlawful because some people will interpret lawful, and this happens to me. People will intentionally misinterpret it. Well, you're talking about natural law. No, no, no you're talking about what's right, wrong. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. Talking about you know state statute, right? So statutory law breaking, not being right or wrong or moral or immoral or breaking or not breaking natural law. So if people want to gamble, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they run a gambling business, they're trading and gambling. Um, in some places they're white market, in some places they're black market, right? These are contextual. Um, so if the state wants to control Bitcoin in the white market, what does it have to do? pass a law. That's it. Now we say, well, it's hard to pass a law. And say, wait, 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 wait. This is how political money is secured. Whether or not you can pass laws, the difficulty of passing laws is what controls inflation of the dollar. Okay. That's a politically controlled money. So when you're talking about securing Bitcoin through the passage or non-passage of laws, you're talking about the dollar. 
that's the status quo. And Bitcoin's not interesting in that context, right? Not to me. Mm -hmm. So so the white market is defined by the fact that people aren't breaking the law. So when you change the law to make what they're doing illegal, they stop doing it or they move into the black market. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin in the white market is easily controlled. Right? People say, no, you can't control it. Well, no, you're just talking about moving into the black market. The question is, how much will illegal trade increase as a result of Bitcoin? Who knows? On a global scale, but you're talking global about a scale, global scale. Um, right, global scale, local scale. Now, people will say, well, there's this jurisdictional arbitrage thing. I've got a topic I wrote up on that, jurisdictional arbitrage fallacy. I can move to Iran, where it's perfectly legal, or Russia, right? And they will defend me. I'm like, great. You're just, you're just part of a big black market you know, corner of the earth, right? That's all. Because from the, and I'm talking again, these things are relative. It's a black market relative to the person who passed the law. And on top of that, you're a terrorist probably if you go to Iran, right? Well, yeah, so, so if you're the American government, European government, whatever, and they all get together and they say, okay, we got this thing, we, you know, it's money laundering and we're going to stop it. And yeah. Bitcoin falls under that umbrella and they're just going to sweep that into the collective money laundering ban. And also we need, we need to have uh, the ability to do monetary policy. So not only do we need to see transactions and authorize them, but we need to be able to print our own money. So we have two issues. One, we need to change a rule, and the other one, we need to uh, censor. Okay, great. So that's, you know, they, they say, well, you can do this as long as you change those two rules, and now it's just fiat. Yeah, it's just state money. So that's what they do in the white market. I call it FedCoin. Everybody else moves into the black market. So whole states could decide, we don't agree. We like Bitcoin. Now, it's kind of counterintuitive because most states, especially any of the larger ones, make a good amount of money on senior auction. Exactly. It's only the tiny ones that use other countries' money. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, you get into this Greece situation, right? Where Greece wants to print some money to inflate away its debt, can't do it because it uh, joined this collective that uh, that doesn't want to pay that tax. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's kind of stuck, right? That's kind of like a state joining Bitcoin, right? Like, like we're gonna we're gonna base our whole economy on Bitcoin, and we're gonna give up that tax revenue. It's hard to do, but certainly possible. Some smaller states do it. So let's say you fall into that category. You're in this state that's protecting you. That's what we call rogue state, right? Like the, the, the banning state would refer to the other state as a rogue state. They support terrorism. They support money laundering. They support drug trade. They support prostitution. They support, you know, trafficking, whatever. So, so okay. So, yeah, you're, from your perspective, you're in the white market. But from a, maybe a larger perspective, you're in the black market. Happens all the time. Plus, there'll be black market internal to the states because states are geographically bounded, right, theoretically. So, so you have this black market and you have this white market. Okay, this already exists. We have these scenarios already. We have it with the drug war, you know, money laundering, all, all these things, war on terror. And so um, the ban is not necessarily effective. People say when I say, people, when I tell them it's easy to ban Bitcoin, they, just laugh. they say, well, it can't be done. Okay, politically, it's very easy to do. Um, uh, it's been done before, you know, gold. And so, yeah, you can't really say that. And if you do, you're just relying on political security. So we go to the idea where it could, it could be banned. And then there's a large black market and it's effective and it's, it's still hurting tax revenues, money laundering, right? It's small term in the global economy, but it's significant enough to, to, for people to care. So then the state moves into, um, in, in those scenarios, the state moves into direct attack, right? Send in the helicopters and the, Columbia or wherever where the drugs are coming from, right? These, these things turn into inter, interstate conflicts. Um, and so uh, in Bitcoin, <clears throat> you don't have to do this. Another one of the unique characteristics of Bitcoin, <clears throat> which is not necessarily positive, but Bitcoin can be attacked, um, directly attacked from a single point on the earth and most effectively from a single point on the earth. It'd be less effective to attack it in a distributed sense. You just put together one big mine and um, you know take advantage of the uh, proximity premium, the variance discount from you know, being a large miner, and uh, mine to censor. Mm -hmm. And if you can, you know, you can get half the hash rate, you will be able to control it. So um, the market has to counter that with fees, which is why fees are necessary to security with the fee premium. People have to pay more for censored transactions. So people are making a trade-off. I want to make this transaction, which is more valuable to me to do in Bitcoin than in a wire transfer, um, probably because I'm operating in the black market, uh, therefore I will pay this premium, which black markets tend to pay, right? There's a cost for, uh, for security. Um, and uh, then potentially Bitcoin uh, is able to overpower the sensor um, and for by forcing it to tax to subsidize its mining. So that's the secure, you know, that in a nutshell is a security model of Bitcoin. 
Um, and, um, you know, so this question of mass adoption is really a question of how big do you think the black market can get? Is there is there is there a step before the black market? Because my 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 thought was, yeah, what if? No, no, because I, at that rate of speed, what if I'm just I'm just I'm just you know I'm, I know it's difficult to predict, but what if, you know, hundred millions or billions people start accum just accumulating, just hoarding, just whatever, just holding on to Bitcoin uh, or Satoshi's, uh, and nothing else. I mean, just the state makes it illegal, so nobody buys it from them. But how realistic, I mean, is it to, you know, a, 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 a concerted effort by nation states? How, I mean, is that foreseeable? You're making the exact argument I, I already dismissed by calling it a political argument. You're basically saying that the way we secure Bitcoin is through the vote. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to get that vote. Okay, so go to your polls and vote for Bitcoin, right? You just created fiat, right? It's secured by the vote. And it hasn't worked out that well. Mm -hmm. Now, gold was secured the same way. It was very popular. Just about everybody hoarded some. Politicians hoarded it. It was used for international trade, interstate you know, settlements, etc. It was banned for use by the, uh, the pop general population in the U.S. And it was seized. And contracting for, for, uh, in gold uh, was, was banned. That didn't, that didn't get lifted until uh, late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. So fairly modern, right? about a 50 year stretch of, uh, of doing exactly what we're talking about with something that's just as popular, maybe more popular, I mean, certainly far more popular than Bitcoin is today. So, so yeah, you can't even use, you know, uh, you know, in his, in his history as a guide, you know, it doesn't support the idea, but from a theoretical standpoint, all you're saying is that the security model of Bitcoin is based on politics, not individual action. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, Bitcoin is designed to operate outside of the state. That's the whole point. Yeah. The tax savings we get is by avoiding the tax. If, you're, if, you're, if your value proposition is tax avoidance, securing the money through the vote makes no sense whatsoever, right? It's, it's, it, you'll, just, you'll just vote for your tax like you did in the first place. <clears throat> so, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, Bitcoin's... You know, this idea of hyper Bitcoinization, yeah, it could happen. Lots of people could end up taking Bitcoin. You can't predict when it becomes important enough for the state to take notice. But they don't really care now. I mean, we even asked them, <laughs> asked EU regulators, uh, you know, at Oxford, what do you, eh, you know, we pay attention to it, um, you know, but it's just not, it's economically not nearly big enough. And, you know, probably cheaper for them just to assume it's going to fail and, and not worry about it. Um, so, so, so the fact that it's not happening now is not evidence of anything except it's too small to matter. And clearly, if it was big enough to be doing what it's intended to do, which is to save people a lot of tax, it would be under attack by the state at a much larger degree than it is now. Um, <coughs> so you, can, you mean by collective action? I mean, you're really talking about like a collective. It could be singular action mm -hmm. by one state, mm -hmm. right? One person who's in control of one state, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, uh, you know, one one kind of orange-haired nutter is enough to put all the hash power you need behind a 51% uh, attack and and a, and a and a single pen stroke to uh, to do some damage to Bitcoin. So you know, we're not talking about a lot of coordinated action here. It can be, and you know, the IMF is designed as a coordinated action by most large states to protect fiat. Yeah, <laughs> comes in and rescues failing fiat around the world. So yeah, they do coordinate their actions, um, and. Uh, but they don't have to. It's not necessary, right? We're just talking about whether it's secure politically. So, okay, so mass, mass adoption um, is a relative term. You know, what's, what's mass? I mean, to me, Bitcoin's got mass adoption. Think about it from a perspective of some startup entrepreneur trying to make something that's huge. Holy crap, Bitcoin's hugely successful, right? So that's one, one answer already is that Bitcoin's already achieved the success it set out to achieve. After 10 years, so, right? No, you know, somebody told me that it was going to do this and I was going to get rich by doing nothing, you know, and, and, and not even investing my money in some company, but just sitting there on it. Right. Um, so not even, you know, putting it, putting it forth as capital that can be used to produce something, but just sitting there on it. Right. It's a speculative wonder. It's magic internet money. It's going to do all these things. Well, that's people putting their own perception on Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't have any objectives itself. It's just a technology. And what I try to do is observe uh, oh, sorry, derive from first principles what that technology is capable of. Mm -hmm. Those first principles not, are not just math and 
probability theory, they're economic theory. And those three things put together aren't sufficient to really define Bitcoin. Bitcoin's based on an assumption that don't exist in those three theories, which is that it's possible for the individual to overpower the state in the manner I described fundamentally, the censorship resistance property, right? You can't prove that people will pay more than the state to get their censored transactions uncensored. Um, but, it's, but, but if you work in Bitcoin, you believe that's possible. Otherwise, you don't work in it, right? If you don't, if you don't believe that Euclidean geometry is useful and because you're a cartographer and you only use spherical geometry or, you know, polar geometry, then, then, then you don't work in, you know, in, 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 in planar geometry. So, okay, great. But, 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 you know, people that basically assume that Bitcoin is not securable can't defend itself from the state, but still want to use it are in a contradictory state of mind. I still, still, still want to believe it's going to achieve these things that it, that it, that they, they think of as censorship resistance and elimination of taxation, um, they're kidding themselves. And it, it's you, you, without accepting the fact that it's possible to defeat state's control of the money, you can't have a value proposition that depends on, a, that's basically elimination of state's control of the money. It's a directly contradictory position. So anyway, that, that, that sums up the, uh, to me, the question of mass adoption and hyper Bitcoinization. These are relative terms, but I think the way people think of them is not really that rational. Um, and, um, the way people think of, you know, I call it the lunar fallacy, the, you know, the to the moon idea, there's no limit, right? There's a limit. I don't, I can't tell you where it is, but it's there. Um, and that's not a bad thing, right? The purchasing power of one unit, one Satoshi is irrelevant. It's a money. It's just, it's just a medium of trade, right? It's not useful, not consumable. It's not useful in any way aside from transacting. So, um, um, you know, it's like gold with no other utility than being a money or it's like paper dollars that can't be burned for heat. So um, the number of units are absolutely irrelevant. It doesn't affect portability. It doesn't affect utility. Um, and so the price on a unit is also completely irrelevant. Changing, changing utility is relevant, but that's why we want stability. Um, you know, using it as a perfect speculative vehicle that only goes in one direction no matter how many people buy it. <laughs> <laughs> is a fantasy um and uh, uh it, it's not it's not a it's not necessary for any aspects of the utility of bitcoin bitcoin is a money um you can save it you can spend it um you can contract in it as a as a unit of account um the more stable it is the better it is at those things and um it's not an investment money's not an investment mm -hmm. Okay. Is a, if, you, if you sit on it, it's a hoard. If you speculate on, on it, you're gambling. If you gave it to somebody else in exchange for a future cut of the revenues, now it's an investment. But the money itself, just hoarding it, is not. Not any more than hoarding gold is. Hoarding gold would never have, you know, over any long period of time, um, been profitable. It maintains value. And this idea that Bitcoin doesn't is based on the idea that it has no, there's no downward, there, there's nothing to mitigate rising demand and there is mm. people ignore it or they ignore well, it in this context mm. well eric but uh, it's, it's fascinating to talk with you this is like um so what <laughs> you're actually saying right what you're actually saying or implying is that most people even in the bitcoin uh uh, community, the, the so-called experts, whether they're you know cryptographers, coders, programmers, uh, Austrian economists, or investors, or all the spokespeople, oh, I know on Twitter, on there are actually is you know then under a mass uh, assumption or mass yeah. illusion or what is that? that's what you're actually saying. I mean, there's a bunch. This is what you. This is I think what you meant when you said you want to clean up with all these assumptions and myths. Is that yeah. what you're actually saying? I and mean, I think that's worthwhile. And, that's you know, a I have, shocker. I, you know? I, debate this stuff, I debate these things constantly, and I hear every aspect of every debate. And when I have, when I hear something interesting, when I discover something interesting, I write a topic on it. Mm -hmm. And I always welcome people to go, you know, go to what I've written and and explain the flaws in my in my in my logic because it's not these are not scientific observations. I'm not doing empirical studies and observing. Well, this is the behavior I see. And people do that. To me, that's not useful because it's economics. And, and as any Austrian should know, that observation is not relevant to economics because economics is based on what's in the human mind and it can change for whatever reasons. And, and human mind. action. Yeah. Right. Human action. So, so things <laughs> like me. time preference, right? Time yeah. preference is a preference. 
It mm -hmm. can't be derived from anything. You can't say as a matter of a proof that something affects time preference in this way. You can, you can talk about it, you can assume it, but you, if you're trying to prove some principle, you cannot make that assumption because it's in the human mind. And um, this, is the, this is one of the first principles of Austrian economics is that time preference is what they call a given. It's given it's you know part of the problem. You know, let's assume time preference is this, that, or anything, but we don't we don't we don't know what it is. So um, every con every every statement you make that involves this idea of time preference has to be relative to that idea that it can change. In other words, subjective value theory. Value is subjective. The value of, of a of a contract for something in the future can change in one person's mind. Not because the market changed it, because I changed it. Uh, I bought something and ah, it's not worth anything. So um, value is subjective. Time preference is a preference. These things are not knowable. Um, anyway, so, so this, there's all these, yeah, um, ideas that float around passing as proof, but are either assumption or you know, kind of scientific assumption, which is I observe something, I see it's repeatable, therefore it must be repeatable. Mm -hmm. I saw this pattern in the, in the past prices of gold. So therefore the future price is going to be this. How often do we see that error, mm -hmm. right? That's the error you're talking about with this, you know, trillion Bitcoin stuff, right? I, I drew a picture and I had a formula and the formula tells me that the future price will be this. Mm -hmm. I mean, that in itself it just should just be dismissed out of hand, but does the community do that? No, they want the price to be higher. Somebody predicts a higher price, they carry them around on their shoulders. So I, I don't care. I'm not looking for, you know, anything but the self-satisfaction of understanding these things and, and helping other people understanding it if they're, if they're interested. And I, and honestly, I, uh, I make mistakes. I learn a lot. Um, and I've, uh, I keep the entire history of all my writings in the GitHub wiki, um, you know, history. So mm -hmm. you can see every change I've made to every, every article and I wrote a couple before I started that I deleted because I'm like, yeah, they were wrong. But I was, you know, it's my first year of Bitcoin still trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's so important to stay open-minded. That's why, you know, I, I really try to, you know, stay open-minded. I mean, I, I, I have my own perspectives and under comprehension of the processes. But, you know, before we wrap, wrap this up, I actually want to talk to you about technological innovation because there's this chapter in the book about, you know, the Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, and the sort of the gold standard, under the gold standard, what kind of technological innovations you know, have emerged or where, you know, we're sort of emerging and, and under the fiat standard that it was actually more an optimization of old technologies, more, you know, of that. Of course, there were original innovations too, but that is something that's really interesting, you know, really interesting to me because I'm, I'm, and that's sort of connecting to my last question to you. How do you, I mean, how would you, if, if everything goes as we envision it, we would have like a really, sound, let's just call it sound money, monetary system in 20, 30 years, would how would our civilization sound, would look like? We would have a sound black market monetary system. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Right? Now, maybe the black market gets very big. Uh, so when you say goes as planned, I don't know whose plans you're talking about. Mine, yours, I don't, you know, I don't have plans for Bitcoin. I just, um, I have observations um, theory, but, but let's, let's say, you know, be generous with your question and just say like, Let's say Bitcoin is effective at reducing tax, which is what it's mm -hmm. designed to do. Yeah. It makes it less costly to transact internationally, personally, you know, when you save, you're not paying the inflation tax. All these, all these, you know, it's programmable, so it's more efficient because it's allowed, right? That's the reason it has to avoid the state because, you know, that stuff's generally not allowed. PayPal can't do it. So um, let's, uh, let's, let's just say that, okay, we've reduced tax. Let's say it's 2%. Oh, that'd be, I mean, that would be huge. Right, if Bitcoin could create a, like a two percent global tax reduction, it's monumental. Or flat tax. I mean, could be a flat tax. We could be good too. Why not a flat flat tax? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Re, you know, yeah, that, you know, okay. Like, and hours talking about the tax equivalents. Um, this Rothbard has some good topics on it. I recommend them. Um, but uh, um, yeah, let's say there's like a global tax reduction. Okay, great. That's Say it's 2%. That's 2% more product mm -hmm. that is not being destroyed, mm -hmm. not being misallocated, right? Not being redirected to aggression to support, you know, hundred, you know, or millions of people that um, do nothing but um, prevent people from doing what they want. 
Now this question, this question of like what's right or wrong, you know, good or bad or a higher or lower value. These are, these are, these are questions of what people want. If I want to do something and somebody stops me using aggression, then I, I've suffered, right? That's a, that's a harm. And, uh, um, so when people write, and uh, I'm going to be specific, when we write about the goals of society, increasing production is not itself a goal of society if you define society as people that interact without aggression. Mm. There is no goal of that society. It's not a state, right? It doesn't have goals. Individuals have goals and their personal goals, which we could refer to as what they want subjective not objective can't be objective whatever they want is their goal mm -hmm. and collectively they trade and produce to create what they want now let's say they they really just like to eat grapes drink wine and you know uh herd sheep that's what they want they don't want to produce great monuments to you know some leader they don't they don't want to sail the seven seas they just want to hang out and chill out so is that bad in, in the definition of good and bad, right? Right and wrong, evil or not. Should somebody force them to change, right? So, so this, this idea that there's, there's a goal of society to grow capital itself is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it implies that somebody should force that to happen, right? And, and, and this should it comes from where? It comes from this idea that they're wrong. Well, they're, they're not wrong. <laughs> what, what definition of right and wrong do you have, right? So, so even though productivity creates products products allow people to build more products more cheaply therefore people get wealthier in terms of having more specifically in terms of having more of what they want right that's what make that, so they're wealthier if they have more of what they want but that doesn't mean they have to have higher or lower time preference those are just their own preferences and if they have a low to, uh, you know high time preference they rather consume than produce i mean then 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 and uh, invest in future production, right? For gains deferred, their time is more valuable to them now. Maybe that's just how they are. There's nothing wrong with that. And what's funny is that when you talk about, you know, the question of time preference, some people will say higher time preference is always better. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so ultimately that means infinite time preference is best. Which basically means everybody starves to death. Because nobody can consume. They have to defer all their all their all their consumption to the future. So there's it's a it's a ridiculous statement. There is no, it's not true that there is a that there's a uh, linear improvement or the some some continuous improvement in uh, goodness through higher time preference. There is a point at which every individual person makes a decision that this is this is what they prefer and that's right for them and that's what's right for society. Right. So Bitcoin shouldn't even have this goal of increasing productivity or increasing time preference. Right. It should have the goal or people people who work in it should understand that the goal is really to satisfy individual desires and individuals desire to keep more of what's theirs. That's why they call it theirs. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't want it. They can just give it away. But is so, it about lowering the time preference or, or increase? Because lowering means it's not about deferring, doing anything the gratification for it's the not future. about doing anything to time preference. That's my that's my point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Changing time preference is not objectively feasible because you don't know what affects what's in people's mind. You can't control it, right? Unless we're gonna to go to some mind control experiment, right? So that's a non goal. The goal is to allow people to express their own time preference, whatever it happens to be low, high, whatever, the goal is to, is to reduce aggression, which means allow people to do, it's a tool, like a gun, to allow people to defend what's there. So they have more of what's there, so less is stolen from them, so they can do what they want with it. Exactly. If they want to eat it versus save it, that's their business, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the goal. They're not the goal of, of people who believe in a free society. The goal of people who believe in a free society is to, is to help people do what they want to do which basically means help them protect their property, their life, you know, their, their limbs, their, their, their loved ones, their money, their, their food, property, whatever, you know, any kind of property. It's all comes down to preserving property. So, so, okay. The goal then is to reduce the taking by aggression, which means tax of people's money, not to change their time preference, 
right? Their time preference is a preference. We don't know what, you know, we can't even show that we could have any effect on their time preference. So, so the, the goal is to retu- reduce taking through aggression. And the way that's done in a, in a, you know, by Bitcoin is by allowing people to do things, uh, by allowing people to transact without having to get permission from the state, which means they're hiding. Unless they're powerful enough to be the state, right? They're hiding. So um, that's why that's why decentralization matters. You can't hide if you're one wall in one big lump. Um, and that's why anonymity matters. You can't hire, hide if everybody knows who you are. Mm-hmm. But people don't really realize why these things matter. That, that's, that's why you have to be able to hide. That's why mining can be done at any scale. Unfortunately, it's more profitable at large scale. But as that becomes illegal, then it just pushes down the, you know, pushes down the scale for everybody. But um, but it's possible to mine in your basement and still on a CPU if not enough people are doing it, right? It's it's all relative. Um, and it's also possible to transact at very small scale. And breaking those things, or some, you could have a coin that's a Bitcoin, but that scales up these factors that make it impossible to hide. Mm-hmm. which makes it a bad one, right? A poor one at security, but still following the same principles. So, so uh, this ability to um, operate in secret, hide, and do these things is, is how people avoid the tax. There's a cost to avoiding the tax, but then the question is, is it worth it to them? That's their choice, right? Yeah. If it's not worth it to them, Bitcoin's not necessary. Um, and it may not be worth it. Really, the cost of defending that platform for them for each individual comes down to how much they're going to be willing to pay in fees and how much they're going to be able to hide their actions um and uh if it's not worth it it won't be hugely successful or you know more used than it is now but it's already used pretty widely um if you know it becomes used too too much too wide, widely enough you know that usage will drop due to um white market prohibition um and we'll see how big its use is in the black market. Um, so it's not provable that Bitcoin secure. It's not a goal of society to change time preference. It's, you know, it's a not free society. And um, it shouldn't be a goal of, of Bitcoin to do that because Bitcoin presumably is, is helping to advance a free society, freer society, which means less tax, more hiding, keeping more of your own stuff um, for its own objective right the objective is just to keep more of your own stuff not to make society have bigger buildings better artwork you know faster ships that's not the goal of society that's the consequence of a free society yeah that's what i would have goal is to be a free society exactly once we have that because (coughs) we we talk so much about bitcoin and every all the facets and aspects of it but sometimes i have the feeling we 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 keep forgetting why bitcoin I mean, in the first place, what was Satoshi Nakamoto's vision? What, what, what is that? I mean, one word, freedom, uh, what is it? Autonomy, is it? Well, if you were to be pro- objective about it, it's tax reduction. It doesn't <laughs> sound so cool, right? So call it freedom, whatever. Yeah. You know, I- individuals' ability to keep more of their own money um, by avoiding inflation and, and surveillance. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't... It doesn't sound so. Doesn't sound so elegant. Oh, Satoshi was just a master tax, ev- you know, tool tool maker for tax evaders. But you know, I think that's what he was after. If when it comes right down to it. So let's what, left. What, what other value proposition does Bitcoin offer? Right? Yeah. I mean, if, if it's if it's authorizable by the state, we already have it. Right. Um, and why wouldn't it be authorizable by the state? Because it reduces their tax revenue. <laughs> I think that's the only reason. Yeah. Avoidance of theft. <laughs> I mean, you know, right. it's, it's uh, a, think of it as an internet gun. You know, <laughs> right? A tool that helps you defend your stuff. Um, you know, didn't design it so people could speculate their way to the moon. I don't believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people might might believe that that's necessary for it to be successful. I mean, clearly, demand is necessary for Bitcoin to to be successful and transacting. If there's no transacting going on, who's Who's valid? Who's who's validating in an economically meaningful way? There's few people who are left transacting, which means when you come back to transact, you may find out that the entire economy, which consists of Amazon, changed their rules, and your money's no good. Right? Yeah. There has to be a large enough economy for the set of all merchants to um, matter, uh, and so size of the economy does matter. 
but that means people transacting, actually accepting and using the money. Um, another common economic error that people make is that money circulates, right? Rothbard has another great section on this, you know, the circulate velocity of money theories, but uh, money doesn't circulate. Every, bud, every unit of coin is always either held or lost permanently. Mm -hmm. So everybody's always holding all money, Bitcoin, every other kind of money. It's always owned by somebody. I can swap that ownership with somebody else, but what did that change? We both, we both profited because we both got what we wanted. Still held, right? So this idea, that, you know, it's just a speculation, you know, the hodling meme is this speculatory meme. It's like, I don't know how to invest. So I'm just going to hold it. Well, you're not investing. That's why it looks like you don't know how to invest. If you, you know, actually invested in the markets and, and, and put your money into people producing things, then, you know, you would get a steady return um, from, from holding. Now, you know, you may or you may not, but it's, uh, it's not predictable that you will, um, though entirely possible. So, um, yeah, just, just uh, but, large swaths of economic mm -hmm. errors, in my opinion. And again, I, I write this stuff up. Um, people are always free to critique it, and often they do. Um, usually have like a daily debate with somebody about some principle, but, um, you know, those are all open for everybody to read. I mean, I had, a, I had a debate with somebody yesterday, and today I kind of cut it off. I, I rarely, I never block anybody. I've never blocked anybody. I only block <laughs> advertisers. I block every advertiser I see. But, uh, but uh, I, I mute people because they start to absorb a lot of time. Um, and if they're not debating, honestly, I just, I just mute them. And by that, I mean, you know, they're not trying to come to an understanding or help me come to an understanding, just absorbing time. And that's even pretty rare. But, but when somebody kind of... Um, you know, we get people that just outright reject economics. Okay, mm -hmm. this is what happened. Like, well, economics is, you know, alchemy. I'm like, no, it's science. <laughs> you know, uh, science is alchemy. Alchemy is science. And, uh, and, and so, okay, if you don't, if you reject economic theory, um, praxology, for example, then you should go and write a book on what's wrong with it, right? Or something. You should prove, you should find the errors in the theory. Well, then you, uh, then the pr discussion proceeds to rejecting reason, right? Like, well, yeah, the theory may be completely based on reason, but only observation matters. Essentially, only science matters, not not math, not probability theory, not praxology. These things are not sciences. They're not based on the scientific method. They're based on logical inference. Well, as soon as you discard the rules of logical inference, you're done arguing. Yeah, no, but the, no yeah, but <laughs> right anymore. the logical deduction, you can find that in Austrian economics, but that's the fundamental problem even with the Austrian economists, whether it be students, professors, or, or the mass, you know, they, they are so brainwashed with the Keynesianisms. I mean, you know, how can we expect them to, to, to think logically, deduce logically? Yeah, um, I mean, I don't know, I, I consider the, 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 the acceptance or rejection of reason itself, right, the rules of inference. Um, a little bit more fundamental than Keynesianism or anything. It's just, a, it's just an inability or, you know, to grasp tr the nature of truth. Mm -hmm. right? um, in other words, there's people that will believe if I, if I see it, it's true, right? What, what did you see, right? Um, you know, so I find these errors are, are widespread in, even within Austrian theory. I mean, people make logical errors. People understand... Mm -hmm. Um, basic principles, you know, um, I, I, I was flipping through the, I, I pulled up the, uh, the scarcity chapter or something like that in the book you pulled up. And uh, I just, I went straight to the monetary inflation. I was going to like, you know, kind of see some of what was said. And um, first sentence, a simple reality demonstrated throughout history is that any person who finds a way to create the monetary medium will try to do it. In other words, if there's a money, people will try to create it. That's an error. It's a clear error. Not anybody who finds a way to create a, mon a money will do it. It will only do it if it's profit. Mm -hmm. I know how to make gold. I go get a pan, go in the river, and I don't do it. I'm not going to make money on it. Supply, demand, error, right? Just because it's possible, they'll do it. And it's not possible to do it with Bitcoin, so they can't. No, no. So it, it, the, the, even, even you know, seasoned economists will constantly make this error of only looking at one side of the supply-demand relation. You know, do you want to see this outcome? I only look at the fact that Bitcoin's fixed supply. I don't critically analyze the demand side. So um, that to me is that what I found is the most common economic error is only looking at one side of the supply demand. Rule. 
Yeah, I think that that was what Rothbard uh, so complained about is that in microeconomics, they understand the supply and demand uh, balance, but not in the macroeconomics or in the you know monetary system. Yeah. So it was actually it was actually Mises who first pointed out the flaw mm -hmm. in the theory of um, st stock to flow theory being applied to money supply. Mm -hmm. so actually, Interesting. I actually have a link to it in my article, but just for historical purposes. Again, it's not an appeal to authority. It's just that you know it's interesting that the Austrian points out the flaw in this supposedly Austrian theory um, um, because it was actually not an Austrian theory. It was a I think it was a Keynesian based theory it was adopted by them eventually mm -hmm. um monetarist you know theory where whereas um you know the it's the supply that de determines the price of the money uh, or you know some, i forget the exact details but but the point was that that mice pointed out that well no demand also matters right mm -hmm. i mean yeah clearly if you you print lots of dollars you know uh, dollar prices tend to rise um all things being equal but all things aren't equal demand affects this as well and so even today when you have this situation where you know there's certainly inflation it's probably you know certainly lied about by the state certainly huge amounts of dollars being printed with you know no longer publishing how much but dollar prices haven't risen that much and that's kind of shocking to you know even people like me right but what does it mean it means demand hasn't risen risen for them so but is it still valid that the purchasing power of the dollar has been decreasing since the uh, uh, inception yeah. of the Federal Reserve of, uh, by whatever, 95%? Is that true? The purchasing power of the dollar has decreased dramatically. If you look at, you know, its ability to purchase, say, certain amounts of things, yeah, clearly. And, you know, I think it's very, um, uh, it's not unreasonable to say that's a direct consequence of increasing supply. Mm -hmm. But when you have a massive increase of supply, and then, you know, objectively small increase in prices or, you know, less than even prior to that massive increase in supply, what has happened? Demand has not, um, de demand has, has, has offset it. it ha it's necessary because it's only supply and demand that are going to cause that effect, right? Mm -hmm. So the demand for all products has, you know, gone down or the demand for the money is, has, um, has, has gone up or something, I, I, you know, so um, it's not, it's, what, that's basically what Mises, is, exactly what Mises is pointed out. It's like, yeah, of course, a change in supply affects price, but, but you're only considering supply. So this stock to flow theory that says, you know, um, you know, if demand is somehow constrained, which it's, it's not, unless you have counterfeit laws, then um, um, the ability, you know, in, the, the, the uh, hardness I refer to as inflation resistance, right? But nothing's inflation resistant. Everything, everything can be produced in greater quantities. You have more demand, you get more supply. You know, Bitcoin being the exception, but it has its own, it has its different way of offsetting increasing demand. And mm -hmm. if that wasn't the case, um, you know, it would be magic internet money. <laughs> it would right. just originally be nothing. Imagine nobody does anything. People just want more of the money. And now everybody's rich. <laughs> no products are ever produced ever, anywhere in the world, but we all really want Bitcoin because that's how we get all the products. <laughs> right? That's yeah. How many products would be. That would be, so be Wonderland. <laughs> Wonderland. Everybody's in Wonderland. And that would be awesome. Yeah. Exactly. But it's, a, it's the necessary conclusion of that theory. Mm -hmm. It is. That's why it always bothered me. That it, was the, it was the nagging outcome. That, that always bothered me. And that's why I sought to find where the stability comes from. And it wasn't until then that I finally, I was, so I was looking really hard at this, you know, clearly supply is fixed. So that's easy, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody looks at that, but I was looking really hard at the demand side of things, trying to find out where demand is mitigated in this system, because otherwise you have this completely irrational outcome and it's not possible. So it wasn't, you know, it was a month that I thought about that. I was like, oh my God, I'm so stupid. It's like right there in front of my face. But that's how hard it is to see, even when you're looking, right? Anyway. Anyway, let's yeah. wrap this up. Eric, I was, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, wisdom, and thoughts, and perspective. Uh, yeah. I'll have you back, to be honest with you, because I want to really talk to you about a very specific question. Um, 
it has to do with technological innovations and uh, and why my my to be honest let me let me just put it right before we go uh here um you know don't you find it peculiar that we have for the last what 100 150 years still combustion engines and like in the transportation system only you know comb fuel uh, burning fuels combustion engines with it no, being, it's cheaper People yeah, but I mean, the form, I mean, the form of transportation hasn't changed, you know, I mean, we have all kinds of... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I used to watch the Jetsons too, you know, and I <laughs> thought for sure we'd be flying around in little space cars, but, you know, people have tried, and guess what? It's too expensive. People have other use for their capital, their money. They don't want it yet. They're not willing to pay enough for it. Well, oh, low yeah. demand, low supply. This is not a question of money. I mean, again, Bitcoin, hard money if you want, yeah. right, is maybe going to reduce tax a little bit. I don't okay. even know if that'll be the case. I just think it'll allow people to do things that they're not allowed to do easier, right? Which is a benefit to society. But, but, um, but okay, so this idea that, okay, we had better money and therefore we had a golden age. Maybe they're related. Maybe, lower, maybe that meant lower tax. Maybe we're paying the highest tax we've ever paid historically. I don't know. I'm not a historian. I don't, I don't really care that much about it. It's just useful for anecdotal, you know, uh, stories. But, but uh but if you look at technological progress or productivity increases over time, objectively, they're pretty consistent. And I think people like Peter Thiel and others who, who, who want to make a statement, they just whip out stories. There's no, it's not even scientific. And if it was scientific, it doesn't prove anything. It's just an observation. Maybe it'll repeat. Maybe it won't. Prices change. You know, you can't predict them with science. So, so I think it's, you know, honestly, I just think it's a bunch of bunk. It's, it, you know, people you know states destroy large amounts of capital world war one and world war two combined destroyed so much capital we could be walking on mars right now having a cheeseburger right. but it, it didn't happen okay well that that's just that's too bad i mean states are destructive of capital but even without that um people people buy the things that they value next most right they, the highest marginal value to them and <clears throat> if something's not worth it to people yet it's not worth it to them yet. If some people think it's cool and we should have it, the question is where does should come from, right? Who are you going to starve to make that happen? You're going to make, make your, you know, cross American tunnel train so that, you know, people can get fast from here to there. But, you know, maybe the market will pay for that. Maybe it won't. But right now the taxpayer pays for those kind of things because they're not demanded in the market highly enough to happen. When they are, they happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so anytime you see a public works project, the state spending taxpayers money on something, you, you can be, you can be sure that it's, it's money that's, it's capital that's being burned okay. as opposed to being put to its best use. Cause the only best use is what people want with their money, <laughs> not what they're forced to accept. So again, always, uh, my advice is always question the, the assumption of good versus bad, right versus wrong. What should be versus what shouldn't be. We should be driving around in these cars. Not if it means putting a gun to somebody's head, to take their money so we can, you know, you know, take, you know, like we do with solar panels or whatever, right? I mean, you know, we're going to subsidize this market, subsidize that market so we can get away from fossil fuels. Well, it turns out fossil fuels are cheaper and more effective and better at transporting stuff and save net energy. I don't know. It, you know there's, there's reasons people use them. Maybe it's just inertia, but it's still cheaper, right? Um, if you so don't have state not, so, so, so you, what you're actually saying is that it's not really the problem with the technological, technological scientific no. innovations or no. it's actually the, whatever the conditions. If, if there's one, if there's one thing that there's no limit of on this earth uh -huh. or in this universe, it's ideas. Okay. <laughs> there is no limit to the number of I ideas. I wanted to hear that. that. Yeah. I wanted to hear that from you. And, yeah. and I don't take credit for that, you know, comment that's Rothbard, maybe, maybe somebody before him in the school, but. But uh, ideas are cheap and they're plentiful and there's lots of people with them. But the problem with turning ideas into products is capital. The more capital that's available for investment, not hoarding, you know, hoarding your Bitcoin doesn't produce any new capital, right? Capital that's available for investment that gets invested, um, gets turned into new, turns ideas into products. Right. Sometimes go buy those. Sometimes they don't. Entrepreneurial risk is a basically a speculation, right? I'm get, betting that they will, betting that they won't. But I need the capital up front to build the product, and then once I build it, market prices it. Maybe I profit. Maybe I maybe I don't. And um, you know, 
and then we move on. So it, but it's capital formation that turns ideas into products. That's it. And so you give more capital formation when you have less taxation because right. taxation drives capital. The whole point of the state is to drive capital away from what the market wants. Otherwise we just let the market do it. Right. It's, it's anti-market capital direction exactly. yeah. and consumption, right. Which is part of the misdirection consumption by bureaucrats, et cetera. So, um, you know, if the market wanted to buy, you know, security against whatever things happening, the market can do that. Mm -hmm. But being forced to do it is, is, is a misallocation of their capital as a matter of definition. So capital destruction, right, is the consequence of the state. And if you can shrink the state, you can form greater capital and therefore you can take these ideas and turn them into products that the market may or may not value. And that's called progress. Um, it's progress meaning the progression of capital formation. Progress itself is not necessary. Is, it's not the goal. It's a consequence of people being able to do what they want mm -hmm. with their capital. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. Well, okay, with, that, with, that, with that consequence of what do, what do we call it? Progress, prosperity. Um, would then these conditions change and, uh, you know, make all those IDs, as you call them, which are actually, you know, patented or whatever, suppressed, uh, become servable to humanity. This is, I, you know, I guess my well, point. That's what productization is, means, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the idea itself has value. Maybe it's a poem and somebody puts in the public domain, everybody values it or they sell it, mm -hmm. right? That's a valuable idea um, or a valuable intellectual property. But the, what I'm talking about with an idea is I have a concept of a product that I want to build. I have no capital to build it, so it never becomes a product. So, yeah, more capital means more ideas get turned into more products. Mm -hmm. That products, um, if they're valued by people, that's economic growth. If they're not, that's economic reduction, right? Like people putting all their capital to things that are useless, say the Soviet Union, right? People putting, or North Korea, putting most of their capital into absolutely stuff they don't want. It's not whether it's the right stuff or the wrong stuff. It's, it's the stuff they don't want, which means it's, I guess it means it's the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. So they are getting poorer and poorer because they're not able to do <coughs> what they want with their capital, right? There could be great products you know, great works of art, hotels, you know, whatever, um, you know, flying spaceships. There was in the Soviet Union, right? But, but people are poor because these aren't the things they want. These are things that are being taken from them. Uh, you know, the capital is being taken from them and being put to uses that is being centrally controlled by the state. That's the problem. It's the aggression in the first place. They could be just as wealthy in terms of GDP. This is why I think it's ridiculous if you use GDP as some concept of wealth. Right. Mm -hmm. GDP isn't wealth. It's, 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 it could be misdirected cap. It could be a bunch of, you know, we, we spend a bunch of tax money on putting a bunch of buildings up in the, in the swamp somewhere that nobody wants. Aggregate ma mal malinvestment. <laughs> that right. So aggregate malinvestment. Great. It's a great, great way to describe it. So, okay. Uh, are we wealthier? No, we're poor, right? We're burning all of our, so we can have a huge amount of stockpiled capital and burn through that over decades. Like, you know, communist countries tend to do showing great GDP, but getting poorer and poorer and poorer every year, right? It's, it's, a, it's a silly concept. Um, so, you know, progress is not the same as, you know, GDP. Um, and the way, fi you know, way finance people define growth, these terms can be very different than the way economists define them. So, um, yeah, let's hope, for, let's hope for people getting more of what they want and not just more products. That's what um, for them being, being made, you know, and, uh, um, you know, in term, uh, yeah, there's certainly periods of time where the apparent, you know, apparent productivity is increasing or decreasing dramatically, and, you know, but, you know, you take the long, long arc of history and it's, it just tends to compound pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. Two fast questions for <laughs> the end. All these, you know, mantras, uh, by whatever mainstream people, uh, politicians or, or, you know, all these co companies popping up with their blockchain, not Bitcoin, this, all, all this blockchain <laughs> hype, you think is, I mean, is this bullshit? I mean, or do we, do, can we really expect, you know, some kind of, I don't know, real productive thing with blockchain? I, I mean, I only work on Bitcoin. I don't know anything about blockchain stuff. Okay. It's like asking me about, you know um trains or building roads or something i you know to me it's it's, it's by def it's not it's not related to bitcoin so i don't know what the, i mean being a little bit facetious um but um 
I just don't even know why people, what do they all start with B? I, I don't know why they're related. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not related. So if you want to, want a little bit more background on, you know, what's the def, this is, a, this is an important point that people in Bitcoin have failed to address. Um, how do you define Bitcoin? People say, oh, it's the chain, it's the code. No, you know, it's, it's not, it's an implementation. What are the concepts that define this thing? And therefore, what makes this other thing not it? Well, that's not the chain. No, no, you know, this is, you know, I use Litecoin as an example. Like Litecoin is a Bitcoin, from what I can see. You know, the code is a few lines different and I can see that and I can see, okay, this is the same set of concepts put to work. But is it more centralized? I uh, just one. I mean, uh, centralization is a social aspect of it, right? We're we're, ta we're talking about the outcome, of, but the but mm -hmm. the concepts at work here um, are not social, right? Like Satoshi's white paper lays out concepts. Whether or not they become centralized or not, you know, is a consequence of those concepts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, potentially, maybe it's just you know they were. Uh, well, I mean, I guess you can leave it at that. It's a consequence of it, but it's not the definition, you know. So, so there's these other things that have different concepts. Say you have Bitcoin and you have, you know, chairs. Chairs are not Bitcoin. Well, why are they not Bitcoin? Because they don't have certain properties. So what are the properties that make Bitcoin Bitcoin? Um, it, you know, it's not the price that they trade on some exchange. It's not like the history in the chain. There are certain properties of the system that make it do what it does. Um, they give it its value proposition, I should say. Mm -hmm. There's other systems that don't, so they're not Bitcoin, and there's no because they don't have the same properties. It's like to me comparing, you know, money and shares. They're different things. Why are we talking about blockchain on a Bitcoin, you know, mm -hmm. call? I don't know. <laughs> so um, you know, there's there's certain cosmetic similarities. They use cryptography, maybe. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, Bitcoin doesn't even necessarily use encryption. It's you know, we don't even know these things. It's, it, there's no, there's no, Bitcoin doesn't even require signatures. I mean, it's not very useful without digital signatures. There's no signing on blocks. You know, you don't, you don't really put your signature on a transaction. You don't do these things like you do with, you know, other types of financial systems. Like Isn't it actually a very simple but primitive technology, Bitcoin? I mean, we, 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 we sort of accept the trade-off of slowliness, inefficiency. You know. it's, an, it's an elegant, it's an elegant system. It has, it has certain... You know the things I'm talking about, like that are downward price pressures with with demand increasing, are not certain, not necessarily flaws, but there are there are kind of flaws. In other words, things that we would like to be better, maybe they can't be better, like the, the uh, pooling pressures, things that make give miners more profit when they're when they're more cl closely located. I call the proximity premium, or when they um, have a higher hash uh, rate rate, which produces um, a variance discount. Um, so yeah, those are things we wouldn't like. I, I call them flaws. I mean, but if they're necessary, they're they're not. You know, it's hard to consider them flaws. They're just necessary. They're a cost. They're a cost you would like to get rid of. Um, other aspects of Bitcoin, you know, not so much. I mean, there's stupid things in the code, but that those aren't what define Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. the, these pooling pressures, they're not in the code. They're in the concept, right? Um, information takes time to cover distance. Um, and, uh, that, that creates these, these pressures or it creates one of them. So, um, yeah, B Bitcoin is distinct from other things. And it's, uh, I've, the topic I wrote on it is called the, uh, crypto dynamics, uh, um, Principal properties. Yeah, I got to read that. Is it one of your articles? Crypt, yeah. yeah, it's in the archive. It's called crypto dynamics uh, as opposed to crypto economics. Crypto economics, I put in this kind of larger category of things that may or may not. I mean, they're fallacies about things that aren't Bitcoin because they're fallacious or whatever. They're economic principles. They're things that help understand Bitcoin. They're crypt, you know, cryptocurrency slash. But what's cryptocurrency? And that's when I basically point out that there is these other set of principles. That's a subset of crypto economics, which I call crypto dynamics, the forces that, that secure uh, slash define Bitcoin. Um, and I boiled it down to three forces. And if something implements those, as a design implements those, um, it's a Bitcoin. If it doesn't, it's not. Mm -hmm. you know? Makes sense. Yeah. If it has two legs, it's not a table. <laughs>
Yeah, okay. <laughs> Wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> well, Eric, thank you so much for sharing. I, I, w I would love to have you back on a very specific topic. If you, I, I think you're very open-minded to that because also of your background, but uh, let's leave it at that. Um, um, yeah, so have a good day and hope to talk to you soon again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Will do. Thanks for having me on. I'll put your links and your um, a Twitter handle if you will, if you want to on um, you know as an info. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks. <laughs>